Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm delighted to be joined by my friend Chris Kendall as a returning guest on the channel. And today we're going to be doing a fun Q&A because Chris has been on the raw vegan lifestyle over 20 years now. <laughs> He's a registered holistic nutritionist and pro skateboarder, raw chef, quite a few accolades. <laughs> and yeah, if you if you wouldn't mind, Chris, obviously we won't bother too much with an intro because you've done that in the past, but if you could just give like a quick 30 second elevator pitch of just, um, yeah, a little bit about you. And if it's no good, then I'll end the recording and yeah, we'll go home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, all good, brother. Um, you know, very briefly, I've been into skateboarding since I was really little, and that led me to moving around and uh, falling apart and being a bit of a drunk. And, you know, that led me to yoga, which led me into nutrition. And uh, I had no intention to do anything with it other than just heal faster so I could skateboard more. But once I got into the raw food diet 20 years ago, after meeting Doug Graham, it impacted my life so much and just changed my mind and perspective. And I was already in school to become an RHN. I just overnight was like, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to dedicate myself to sharing this information with others and helping people with their health goals. And it took me like five years, almost four and a half years of applying it to feel comfortable doing it as a profession. But now it's been uh, over 16, seven, near 17 years actually yeah, doing this full time with the raw advantage. So that's me I'm living in Sweden I'm from Canada and I'm 44 years old. Awesome. Yeah. That's the rundown. <laughs> yeah, that's so, the quick... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's actually a surprisingly difficult skill to summarize it that quick. Uh, but yeah, I've just got a long list of questions here from the audience. So let's start off with a fun one. Uh, what's your favorite meal slash food? Oh, wow. You know, I, I'm going to give the generic lame answer really quickly, just saying whatever ripe, top quality fruit that's in my hand, you know, and, and that could be mm. tomatoes or that could be durian or that could be cherimoya or that could be nectarines, which I have. When it's peak, I swear every single time when I'm eating it, I'm like, nothing is better than this. Like I've said that for all of those foods. Um, and then it gets tricky and I know I'm just giving lame answers, but it gets a little tricky because it's like, if it was once in a while, or if it was like, this is the only food you have, it'd be a bit of a different answer, you know? Cause if it was once in a while, mm -hmm. I might say durian is my all time favorite meal. But if I had to have that every single day year round, I know I would get sick of it. Uh, whereas some things like actually bananas, which definitely aren't even necessarily in my top five, like favorite taste. If I was going to eat that one meal a day, always, it's one of my favorite staples. I almost never get sick of it. And I'm always so excited to come back to it. So, um, but strictly, strictly flavor wise, it might be cherimoya, but mm. I don't know. There's so many, man. I, I feel blessed by the abundance and uh, the peace, love and seasonal fruit that is this lifestyle, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I've never tried cherimoya, but I've heard good good things. It's also called like custard apple, isn't it? Or something like that? That's a slightly different variety. It's in the Anona family as well. But, um, oh, okay. but there's custard apple, sugar apple, um, guanabana, uh, biraba, uh, cherimoya, and right. atamoya. And some of them are crosses and stuff. But of all of them, my absolute favorite is the cherimoya or the atamoya, which a little similar to the cusper apple, but it's a uh, way more smooth texture. And I like the sweetness more. It's like, I would honestly describe it as like a cross between papaya, pineapple, papaya, mango and candy, but it's hard to even mm. pin any of those individual flavors. It's just like unbelievable. The only, only qualm I have with it actually is how many seeds are in it. You know, like if it was mm. like a, like a banana where you peel it and there's no seeds, I'd be a, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to eat anything else, you know, but it is phenomenal. So get your hands on it. Yeah, I'll try my best. <laughs> so if like, if it was like a, your final day on this planet, like, and it had to be like breakfast, lunch and dinner, what, what would be like, I don't know, top three meals, <laughs> like a perfect wow, day, like really everything's awesome. perfectly right. Yeah. Um, I, I would probably say, you know, cause right now I'm like the nectarines, I was just saying yesterday, you know what? I I think I might like nectarines more than mango. And I almost feel blasphemous saying that, but they're so darn good right now. And you know, they're the easiest food in the world. Like you don't have to peel it. You don't got to do anything. You, just, you eat it and you spit the seed out or throw the seed out and it's like clean. So right now I'm just going to say, maybe I'd have nectarines for breakfast, uh, cherimoyas for lunch and durian for dinner. And mm. yeah, <laughs> sounds like, that was, that was maybe like the most simple, simple form probably mm -hmm. for a perfect day. And I mean, I, I could honestly say almost every birthday I have, I try and have durian for my dinner. So that kind of tells you something. Mm, yeah, 
I'm still yet to try, but I've heard <laughs> I've heard so many good things about it. Um, and yeah, so the next one, kind of linking into that, um, what's it like to be raw vegan in Sweden? And have you ever done it in a warmer country before? Absolutely. Well, I'll answer that backward. I have been a raw vegan in multiple, multiple countries. You know, I've lived in Canada. I've lived in the United States. I've even worked up north uh, in the Arctic. You know, I, as a raw foodist, when I was working outside, minus 40, 14 hour days, uh, here in Sweden, actually, it's much more mild. You know, it's like where I'm at, it rarely gets below plus two or three or much, not much below zero. And if it mm -hmm. is, it's very short lived. Snow doesn't stick here, for example. Uh, and the summers are mild too, like 15 to 25 is usually kind of the, the window, which almost is perfect for me. Like I, I would almost prefer to be in like plus 15 to 25 always. I, I don't really love 30, 40, which, you know, my hometown mm -hmm. Saskatchewan actually, it gets to like minus 45 almost every winter. Uh, and it can be up to plus 55. And the coldest day on record there was minus 56 Celsius or no, minus 64 Celsius. So it gets ridiculous. So I've lived in all those kind of climates. I've also lived in California. I've spent multiple years when you add up all the time in Costa Rica uh, and Mexico and a couple places out here in Europe for pockets of time. But I can honestly say now at this point, I don't find it any easier or any harder anywhere in the world I am. Uh, in many ways, I actually prefer this type of climate to the tropics. And what I find, for example, because a lot of people uh, glamorize the tropics and just like think, oh, I'm a raw foodist. I got to live close to the tropics and this and that. I, I don't want to live there, to be honest. I'd rather take vacations there every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I find it's too hot and it just makes me feel lazy in body and in mind. Also, typically in the tropics, they have a lot of tropical fruit, which can be really inexpensive and great. And I love the tropical fruit. It's some of my favorite. But all the other fruit, the uh, subtropics, the temperate, they have very little availability and really poor quality and it's really expensive. Whereas somewhere like here, actually, I get the whole gamut, you know, and, and I get really good deals. So like, I was just mentioning to you before this, like I, I, I generally spend like 200 to $300 a month eating almost unlimited fruit, which is at least a 6.5 to nine out of 10 in quality. And once I'm in that sweet zone of like 7.5 to nine, I'm, I'm happy as a peach, you know? So uh, I find it easy out here. I really love it. I also look at other aspects of uh, my life and what I want in my life mm -hmm. as a really big priority. So, you know, good friends and uh, skateboarding, you know, so all those things are in spades here as well, you know, so I, I absolutely love it. Uh, it's one of my favorite places in the world. But again, you know, maybe the first few years as a raw foodist, it's harder. But I think after you kind of get your grounding and you recognize, you know, as long as I'm eating enough of foods that I love, uh, I don't really care too much about what it is. It's just as long as it's something I'm enjoying and it's a uh, pretty darn good quality. Well, I just roll with the seasons and enjoy tropical vacations to get that like extra kind of super mm -hmm. duper good quality durian and jackfruit and chumpadak or something like that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think that kind of sweet spot of like 20 to 25 Celsius and like obviously nice sun it is it's probably the best of both worlds because you can still like be active in it without feeling lazy yeah exactly you start to feel rubbery and you know mm. i've made an observation it's kind of interesting but the the people and countries that have a little bit more variability and have some kind of seasonality and cooler times often are a little bit more industrious you know uh or mm. necessity you know and they're, they're i think they're a little bit more focused and you know, the hotter year round climates typically are a little bit more siesta and chill and, you know, which I, I like that kind of mode and I like to bring that into my life. But I do also like the extra, um, extra things that come along with that kind of society, you know? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And one yeah. last thing I'll mention too, I think a lot of this comes to perspective because in my first few years as a raw foodist, I really felt like I hated winter. I was like, this is so crappy. I'm not meant to be here. Uh, I can't go outside and do the things I can want to do. And so that actually created discord and made me thrive less and feel less happy. And after a while, I was just like, you know what? I, I enjoy the different seasons and it gives me a pause in certain activities and allows me to kind of cross train a little bit different and shake things up and focus on other aspects of my lifestyle rather than just, just fruit or just outdoor activity, you know? So and you can still have outdoor activity, of course, in the winter. But uh, I'm pretty lucky here in Sweden, too. There's an amazing indoor skateboard park that they change every year. And it's like 
world class. And I almost prefer the indoor skate park compared to outside skateboarding. So it's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm laughing, man. I'm, I'm loving it out here. Mm. Yeah. It's a great perspective, especially things like the, the seasons. Obviously we can't directly control them. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's good to see that no matter what the season is, there's always benefits like to each season. Yeah, definitely. Cause you, even like I catch myself sometimes cause it gets quite cold and gray and rainy here. Like, yeah. think like around the winter time like just like i do notice my mood dip a bit more so yeah i think it's it's important to focus on the benefits as well um, Absolutely. And do, yeah just just touching on that do you have like any tips for people in colder climates so obviously you said you spend like two to three hundred um what was it euros i assume in sweden or i, I usually uh, i usually speak in dollars american dollars oh, of course yeah because it's yeah yes I'm, swedish crone isn't it yeah. i'm from um, canada but i i still make money in us dollars and i'm i'm aware of the different exchange rates and stuff like that mm -hmm. but it's close enough comparison you know but sure. uh yeah, so, yeah how mean, do you get stuff so cheap and good quality well you know no matter where i go i i find myself being a fruit hunter and out here i actually found wholesalers before other friends who lived there here their whole life you know so i I found wholesalers that would actually sell to individuals, but then I also, I have my business here, which is a, a raw food business, of course, and a chef and stuff. So I can actually have a wholesale account, but they still will mm -hmm. let you. So it's just one of those things where, you know, wherever you go, look for wholesalers, look for farmers markets, look for ethnic markets, you know, get to know people, talk to them, let them know what you're doing and how excited about produce you are. And oftentimes they'll be as excited as you. Like they might really, really enjoy it. You talk to the person that does the ordering, and, and they may give you some extra tips or they may give you case prices and deals. Uh, you start to let them know like, hey, if you have an abundance of something you need to get rid of, let me know. And I've had people, even like grocery store uh, produce managers call me like, hey, Chris, we got a couple extra cases of bananas. You want them for cost? Like, and, you know, all those things really help cut down costs and make it more fun and connected, you know. So I, I really like that. Um, some other tips for the winter. And you were kind of mentioning kind of being a little bit low and stuff like that. It's important to recognize, you know, the impact that vitamin D has on our overall health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So whether you're taking a trip out to the tropics, whether you decide to supplement with a quality vitamin D supplement, whether you decide to get a vitamin D lamp, you know, I use a vitamin D lamp in the winter, or whether you utilize mushrooms and uh, charge them up under a UVB lamp, all of those things are a great way to bolster your vitamin D. And that helps you elevate your mood and all the other hormonal processes that are uh, implicated with adequate vitamin D, you know, so mm. that's a big one. Something that some people don't recognize is when you are in a colder climate and you're going to be exposed to cold a little bit more often, uh, your body requires a little bit more thermal energy. And usually that just equates to hundred or 200 more calories per day, depending upon your cold exposure and how cold you keep your house. You know, the colder mm. you keep your house and the more you're out in the cold, the more you're going to burn to create that heat in your body. So it will require a little bit more uh, calories. So that's kind of useful to know. Uh, you know, of course you can do things like dress warmer. That's one of the most classic ones, uh, get some more exercise to improve your circulation and generate mm. heat from movement. You know, you can do different types of pranayama and breath work to increase the heat in your body. Uh, you know, you can eat warming foods, you know, like ginger or hot peppers, if you want, if that's part of what you enjoy. Um, but all of those things are, avenues to make this a lot easier in the winter and then again again it's just like what are you focusing on you know are you focusing on what you can't get or are you focusing on the things that you can do to improve your life and all the other various lifestyle factors so often people just hone in on fruit and think like if i'm not mm -hmm. getting perfect fruit then my lifestyle isn't perfect and i'm not going to achieve my health it's like that's just one small piece you know like once we're eating a pre pre uh, predominantly kind of fruit or fruit and green based diet in my mind, we can kind of let go of fruit, food and nutrition and then focus on the other stuff and just, you know, yeah, try and get quality, like learn how to make great recipes and enjoy it a ton. And uh, otherwise, you know, just focus on all the other good stuff. And that makes everything way easier. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about focusing what focusing on what you're passionate about, what you want to put your energy into as well, like you say. Yeah. Cause what obviously you want to fruit... create rather than what you want to consume, you know, I think that's a exactly. Good yeah. Bit. Yeah, it's a good shift. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and now uh, you touched on vitamin D. So I've heard you in the past talk about like the lamps. Um, so is that from the brand? Uh, oh, what was the name? Was it Spurty or something like that? You, 
Yeah, yeah. So I'll admit I am an affiliate uh, for Spurdy mm -hmm. uh, on my Instagram thing. You can click it and get, I think, 20 or 25 percent off maybe. Um, mm -hmm. But I did purchase my own at full price. I didn't get any discount and I became an affiliate after I did that just for clarity. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I've, I've, it's one of the better quality, less expensive home units. Like you can spend tons, like it's not super cheap. You know, it's, I think it's like when I got it, I think it was like three ninety nine, like almost $400, but mm -hmm. you can get, you know, like $1,200 up, you know, for most other units. So it's uh, one of the more affordable, effective home units that you can get. And it's like really, really well studied and, um, mm -hmm. you know, shown to be definitely clinically effective. Mm. And how does that function? Because obviously the sun, there's all these different spectrums of light and things. What what does the do you know like rough kind of what the uh, lamp like recreates? Is it yeah? What does it kind of create within the body? Yeah, it it, it contains the main spectrums required for your body and the uh, the synthesis of the vitamin D on in, in your skin. So mm -hmm. I I don't at the top of my head have the exact wavelength. Uh, yeah, yeah. The variability, all of them they have. But it is, you know, it's it's kind of funny because it's got a little timer on it that sounds like an easy bake oven. Like it goes like click, 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 ting when you're done. <laughs> so you feel like you're kind of baking like a little pie. And you know, when you first get it, you just set it for like two minutes and do that once every mm -hmm. two days. And after a while, as your skin adapts to it a little bit, you can do like I think up to three or four minutes, you know, every day or every other mm -hmm. day. And it's, it's really simple. You know, I, I just sit in front of it and sit cross leg and do a little bit of yoga or breathing and, you know, easy, quick thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I might look into them because obviously in the, in the winter, the angle of the sun, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, certainly a bit of a obstacle to navigate. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, one of the advantage, advantages of that too is, you know, while the most uh, known uh, benefit of the sun exposure and the light exposure is the vitamin D production. There are other benefits as well that you wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. be getting just from a, a regular supplement. So while a supplement can give you that vitamin D, the uh, light exposure is supposedly more beneficial all around. You know, you can still maybe get that nit nitric oxide if you eat greens and stuff like that and, you know, other benefits from the light exposure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And in terms of supplements, do you would you like recommend like a lamp over a supplement, like a, a D3 supplement? I, I, I personally would, but again, it's like a, that's kind of a personal preference. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I also, I mean, I also use red light therapy and that's another wavelength that has different benefits that you'd be getting from the sun as well. So like, I'm, I'm kind of hitting it from both of those angles, you know, like I like to do all of that. And there have been times that I supplemented before I had this, uh, this light. And especially when I was in the winter and, you know, after my motorcycle accident when I wasn't outside for half of the summer and bone healing and stuff like that. So mm. uh, I think all of them can fit people. And if, you know, if you're on a budget or if that's just out of your reach, you know, supplementing is a good course of action, I think, uh, especially if you notice yourself getting kind of low. Uh, I used to be pridefully anti-supplement. And while I very, I supplement very few things, like really the only two things I've ever supplemented in the last 20 years is vitamin B12, which is more regular and vitamin B or sorry D uh, in some odd occasions when I didn't travel to the tropics or when mm -hmm. I uh, got in that motorcycle accident, I, I now do prefer the light box since I got it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Just got to do the best you can with what you got. And yeah, exactly. none of this stuff to me is worth stressing or making a huge deal about. It's just, you know, do the best you can and make sure you're covering all your bases. And, you know, I, I think to me, that's the you know, the most rational kind of, uh, easy going approach. Mm, definitely. Yeah. You, so you touched on B12. That's, that's something that I've changed my thoughts on since obviously the start of my journey, because there's a lot of, um, various like philosophies and concepts around it. Um, and obviously in an ideal world, you'd like to think we get adequate B12, but, um, obviously I think it's more of a flaw in our modern world, isn't it? The, the lack of B12. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we live in a sanitized world where we're, you know, washing ourselves much more regularly with soaps and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And we're not drinking from natural streams and environments and, you know, all those different aspects. I mean, even just going to the bathroom in a really cleanly place and you know, using paper and washing our hands vigorously afterwards and stuff like that uh, would lead us to less exposure than we normally would. You know, we still are likely getting some from our environment and or from, you know, our nasal cavity and stuff like that, you know, but 
it's very rare the individual that is sufficient without any supplementation after you know seven, ten, twelve, fifteen years uh, as a vegan or raw foodist. And most people on most diets have uh, issues. So I, I like to look at philosophy and and you know look at ideals, but also be grounded in reality and what we see happen all the time. And you know, be um, proactive and like I've done blood work and all those kinds of things and seen st- the my values go down over time. You know, so. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's of our benefit to be a little bit relaxed about these kinds of things. And, you know, I've seen people who stuck to a philosophy, you know, and to their detriment, you know, cause nerve damage and stuff like that more than a few times now. So, uh, to me, it's something that, you know, again, the pride of not supplementing or the idealism of it. Sure. It sounds great. And, you know, maybe some people can, if they're, uh, you know, in a more pristine environment and really looking after everything. But even still, I think it's wise to periodically check and be open-minded to these kinds of things. Mm, definitely. Yeah, I think results over dogma is, is probably a good approach. It's, yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> like I say, a little cat, cat tail. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of B12, just just quickly, what would you what would you recommend if, if someone was to take one? Would it be like the sublingual? or Because um, I've seen certain research saying that only like, 50 percent or i can't remember the 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 exact figure but only a certain percentage of people can absorb b12 in certain forms Mm -hmm. um but obviously that could be just due to the cleanliness of their body or or things like that so i'm just wondering what what would you recommend in terms of the most um easily absorbable form of b12 well typically uh typically the uh the one that our body actually, uh, you know, utilizes and creates itself. So methylcobalamin is, uh, mm-hmm. is the most common, but people, some people, yeah, they don't really absorb it properly for some reason, this or that. And so coupling that up with uh, adenocobalamin is generally the recommendation in that situation. And the sad thing is it is, is much more expensive to have the combination of the two. Um, so oftentimes, you know, starting with the methylcobalamin, and then, you know, getting some tests once in a while. And if you don't see your values staying or going up, then consider the combination of those two. The most studied form and uh, the cheapest form is cyanocobalamin, which actually most doctors, even vegan doctors recommend just because again, it's like less than pennies per pill, you know, so you can have a year supply for like a couple bucks and it's really, really shelf stable. But some mm-hmm. people are really worried about it because it is connected to a cyanide molecule, which of course we know is, uh, is toxic. Um, the only issue, uh, the only issue with that kind of thought of having fear around that though, is it's in such a small amount that our body can easily metabolize and, and excrete it. You know I mean? There's even cyanide in apple seeds and, you know, people drink apple juice and stuff like that and don't really think about it too much, but as soon as it's in a pill, they worry. So I'm not super concerned about that. I still actually generally get the methylcobalamin, but I have in the last 10 years had some bottles of cyanocobalamin. Um, so I think both of those are good options, but again, I think it's wise to uh, periodically, especially when you first start uh, supplementing something like that, to, to do a check. You know, you can do a homocysteine check and a UMMA or an MMA test, which is a urinary methylmalonic acid test or just methylmalonic acid test. See your values and uh, and then you can see if it's working for you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And that, that methylmalonic acid, that has like an inverse correlation, doesn't it? Like if that's high, that means um, B12 is low. Am I right in thinking that? It's, it's a collaboration, corroboration with the homocysteine and typically yeah, if the, if the methylmalonic acid is within range, then you can be all ideal, but, uh, the, it's the homocysteine, if it's really elevated, uh, then that's really indi- indicated that the other test wasn't super accurate. Because, right. Yeah. So I see, I see. Cool. Um, so yeah, okay. just quickly, I'm trying to think other common, oh yeah, iodine. I've recently mm-hmm. had quite a lot of thought about iodine um so yeah do you what's your approach to iodine well you know it's interesting you know the the reason why that started coming up was from people living in what is called the goiter belt in the states and what they saw is people living in there started getting enlarged thyroids and uh that came down to having a deficiency in iodine and the reason it's called called the goiter belt is because it was an area in the states that was not underwater in its recent past, so the soil there had lower levels of iodine compared to other levels mm. uh, in other places in, in the States or around the world that at one point was under the sea. 
And so, you know, if they're eating predominantly food from that area, you know, they're getting less iodine than most people. Uh, the reality these days is, you know, most people are consuming food from various sources all over, and most of those are going to have some. That isn't to say that iodine isn't an issue or can't be an issue. It's just that, you know, as long as you're eating a varied diet uh, from various sources, you know, doing some traveling, you know, stuff like that, then you're less likely. Uh, all this, again, this led to them making iodine salt. You know, so they, just, they started putting iodine in the salt. But if you're not having any salt, which probably most of the people here aren't, especially mm -hmm. iodized salt, then again, that can set you up for it. So my, my approach though, that with that kind of preamble is I don't eschew seaweeds. You know, the first decade on a raw food diet, I did kind of take the philosophy that, you know, we're terrestrial and, you know, we, uh, you know, don't want to eat seaweed, sea scum, whatever. Right. So I avoided mm -hmm. it completely. I've never had any thyroid issues. I've never had any iodine issues. Um, I've done tests, you know, clinically, and I've also done the less clinical, but still significantly uh, helpful test of just actually putting iodine on your skin and seeing how long it takes to absorb or if it stays on there. And, mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, again, now I, now I actually do utilize different seaweeds and I really enjoy them. Uh, some people claim that all the iodine is, uh, dissipated from them, but, you know, they're clinically shown to actually reverse, uh, iodine issues, you know, so, uh, there's obviously iodine in there and different types have different amounts. So for myself, what I typically do is one, I mean, I do also eat mushrooms, which if they're grown in iodine rich soil, they're rich in iodine. Um, uh, and then with the seaweed, I really like nori and I'm going to give a shameless plug. Uh, rawnori.com with the code CHRIK. You can get 5% off their certified raw, vegan, GMO free, um, actually assessed for heavy metal levels regularly Nori, which is the best I've ever had. And that's why I became an affiliate for them. And I love them. And I genuinely do eat them quite often. Like I'd say on average, once, once or twice a week to once a month. You know, some, mm -hmm. somewhere in that range, you know, and, um, you know, uh, I use, you know, about four sheets and I just wrap my salads. I just make like sushi burritos. Um, otherwise I do also utilize, uh, uh, dulse on occasion, just like sprinkling it on stuff. Um, I yep. do use Irish moss on occasion as well. Um, and, uh, on a lesser occasion, I have uh, kelp, which is like super, super potent, mm. like just a pinch, you know, all of these have different amounts that is a safe amount. You don't want to overdo iodine or seaweeds. Um, but I think it is a benefit to bring them in for not only the iodine, but the other wealth of trace minerals. And, you know, it's interesting because primates have been observed actually going into water bodies and eating different algaes and seaweeds and stuff like that. So it's not like it's completely crazy, you know, and, and, you know, we aren't meant to do that. You know, it's, a uh, uh, from further research to me, it actually makes more sense to utilize those things. And the last thing I'll mention there is I mentioned the raw nori and, uh, the other company that I get the other seaweeds from, I'm not an affiliate for, I just buy them from it because it's what I've researched and what Dr. Rick and Karen Dina have researched as one of the best, most reliable sources that again, re routinely tests all the seaweeds for heavy metal and radiation and stuff like that is, um, seaveg.org, I believe, or it's seaveg.com, one of the others, but, uh, yeah, I enjoy all of those. And uh, I find that that's a good way to regulate your iodine. I'd rather do that myself than supplement straight iodine personally. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because like you said, there's there's um, definitely risks with having too much of it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. It, yeah, I'm, I'm always a little bit skeptical. Mm, I'm always a little bit skeptical when people create, a, make something sound like a huge problem and then they sell like a, a solution like an iodine test and supplements so like yeah uh, it's just whenever people create that kind of fear mindset I, i'm just always always concerned as to what they're selling um yeah especially if they're the only expert that can do it you know or you, you mm. need their services to do it because that i mean that is the truth though with it you know and that's not to to bash there is the reality that like you said it is tricky especially if you're if you're supplementing it directly uh, mm. because excess has similar symptoms to, uh, having not enough. Right. So that's why, you know, like I, I do understand, uh, the general amounts of each of those types of seaweeds, how much is enough and, uh, how much is too much. And, you know, sometimes I might have a little more and sometimes I have a little less, like I said, sometimes I might go a month without any of them. 
but having a little bit here and there, you know, and, and recognizing for most people, like four nori sheets is an average serving every couple of days or like, you know, like a, a quarter teaspoon of dulse or like a pinch of the kelp or, you know, like a tablespoon of the uh, sea moss every once in a while. Like all, all of those things are like a serving, right? So just having that general knowledge can help you not overdo it. And it's not something you need to eat every single day. But what I find with that and with other foods within the raw food diet, the longer you go about it, your body becomes much more attuned and intuitive. So it's like all of a sudden I'm looking at that. I'm like, yeah, I kind of want some of that, you know, and I might have a month mm. where I'm not really concerned or not even thinking about that, you know, and while maybe that's not perfect, I do trust the body and its intuition, especially the more open and uh, uh, in the moment kind of common awareness, uh, that direct awareness and experience, it, it gives you good feedback. Mm, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So if people eat like a variety um and like some sea vegetables they should cover that cover that base with the iodine and other things yeah. as well um yeah yeah i've also found that yeah no i was just gonna um touch on your last point about the intuition and um yeah just personally like at the start of my journey i was very drawn to mono meals and just uh specific fruits but then like you say you do kind of begin craving that variety a bit more and do you feel like it's the specific micronutrients in, in a food you may be like craving and your body's telling you that or what do you think is the kind of reason behind that I, I think it's a combination i think it's the micronutrients uh i think it's also some of the anti-nutrients building up in certain foods um mm. and i think sometimes it's just you know the the desire for different tastes and for stimulation yeah. you know and also excitement around like oh my gosh this is now like new and that's kind of uh, old you know so i think it's a combination of all those things but when you really start to either get a disdain for something, like I've had the experience where I ate a lot of spinach and I got to a point where I was like, whoa, like I don't want, I don't want spinach. Well, I think that was more probably an anti-nutrient building up or a threshold of some of the nutrients in there, just, you know, getting to a point where my body's like, I don't need any more of that in that concentration, you mm -hmm. know? And um, I think a really cool point actually on that too is true needs uh, persist, you know? So it's like, if you have like a specific craving over and over and over for like weeks and a month, yeah. pay attention. And, and it doesn't necessarily even mean that it's that specific food. It could be a nutrient in that food. So if you're like, I just really want this, well, research it a little bit. Look at what what's in that and what's really high in it. And then, you know, mm. if it's something you enjoy and you can get, well, yeah, eat some of it. But if you can't get it or if it's just ridiculously priced or poor quality, try another food, like research another food that is similar in that nutrient makeup and see if eating that actually curbs the craving for that other food. And, you know, that can help you with sufficiency and, uh, you know, making it a little bit easier on your wallet and your mind too. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. On, on the spinach, I hear a lot of people say um, it's really high in oxalates or, or yeah, like which, which obviously is one of the higher ones. But I was in my mind. I was thinking. I wonder if they've studied like baby spinach versus like mature spinach because obviously it's it's very different, isn't it? Like the soft, yeah. tender leaves compared. Um, how do you feel about like oxalates or oxalates, whatever they're called? And well, like, well first off, yeah. you're spot on. Yeah, baby spinach is a lot lower in oxalate than uh, old mature mm. spinach. So I, I would prefer. I mean, you know, generally speaking, you know, it's recommended fruits and tender greens. You know, young tender greens as the optimal. Uh, so. With spinach, that's what I'd say. Um, I don't eat a lot of spinach. Actually, I, it's pretty rare actually to have spinach these days. I used to eat it a ton, but it's not because I, I just purposely avoid it or think it's like, a, you know, really bad for you. There is actually um, a uh, probiotic that utilizes and eats the oxalates. So if, if, you're, if your microbiome is uh, robust and you actually have that uh, microbe, then there's benefit to having some oxalate, but even still, I, I do think, and the the information out there does really suggest that you can't overdo it. So, um, I actually think there's a benefit to having some oxalate foods. Luckily, many foods we eat, even fruits, have some oxalate. So, you know, if you have mm -hmm. a, a functioning microbiome and you have consumed some, then it has less impact on you than somebody who, say, just had a round of antibiotics or you know isn't used to a fruit and veg based diet and has really low amounts of that microbe. So, yeah, so I mean, the, the distilled version of that is I don't go out of my way to eat lots. I don't go out of my way to completely avoid it. Um, it's not a super common green for me, and I actually avoid chard. 
you know, Swiss chard because I actually get a dry itchy throat when I eat it. And it's like mm. as higher, higher than spinach. And actually I think it's higher than spinach and oxalates. Uh, so yeah, but yet yeah, young tender and, you know, enjoy what you enjoy. And, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily have a high oxalates as a main, main green, but uh, having them on occasion, I, I think is a, a very healthful green. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think there's always nuance around like topics like this, because often online, it's always um, bold sweeping statements like, oh, plants yeah. are trying to kill you, like, <laughs> you know, avoid this, like, but like you say, then you find out that there's a lot of nuance around the around the topic. Um, there usually is, and it's you know I was actually just thinking about that earlier. In in some ways, it makes me a little sad because it it is those sweeping black and white statements that is most attractive and garners the largest audiences and uh, you know even cult followings of individuals because it's like it's fantastic and it's amazing you know and um, I, I've never been one to really do that because I, I see the gray and I, I like to really research it and try and be as open and honest, but it's it's not as fantastic and amazing and like gripping of a message you know so um so there mm. there is that reality i think with a lot of things that are out in the raw food movement or vegan movement or carnivore movement and uh, usually those people that are the most outspokenly black and white uh, or dogmatic get the largest audiences mm. and, you know sadly to the detriment of a lot of people and people become disillusioned when they recognize that that wasn't the definitive truth or have issues because of it you know so mm. it's, a, it's an interesting reality Definitely, yeah. But I guess one benefit of being a little bit more nuanced and, and um, just seeing the grey is if you do ever change your thoughts and feelings on a topic, you can kind of, you can be a bit more fluid around it. Whereas if you're like strict, like carnivore, and then you backpedal, like one of the most prominent ones, um, Paul Saladino, like then when he reincorporated fruit, it's like, hang on, one minute you were saying <laughs> it was just meat. So it's, yeah, it's. I think it's good to be a little bit fluid and just, yeah. I think, and, and beyond the outside perception, it, that can be harder on the system, you know, the microbiome, mm. as well as it can be, uh, you know, I think harder mentally, emotionally, you know, like, especially for people, like I feel, I feel, you know, my heart goes out to people who, you know, apply a raw food diet or a vegan diet and are really black and white, but not super well educated and have a hard time and then think the diet failed them and go somewhere like carnivore and they're, they're fixed in their mind that I did it perfectly because I listened to this and this and you know, but again, if there isn't that fluidity, that flexibility, um, that, that larger body of knowledge and asking people who've been walking this path and, and know the ins and outs and can fine tune it. Um, I, 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 again, my heart goes out to them actually, cause it's like, I can't imagine how mentally, emotionally challenging it would be to go from really full, firmly believing in veganism to completely doubting it to the point where they reverse their views and often become anti-vegan. Like, you know, mm. they might champion that with pride. But inside, I'm sure that was a major death and uh, a restructuring of their their thoughts, beliefs, and you know themselves. You know, so that's a uh, wouldn't be easy on anyone. Mm, yeah, definitely. Like you say, and you know, just uh, just about stress and and hard labels and identity, like even things like your B vitamins, they're impacted. Like you burn through them when you're Huge. stressed. Yeah. Huge. What What do you personally do for stress management and just just yeah, seeing the the good side in life and enjoying it and having fun. What what, what kind of things do you personally adopt? Well, I, I think it's a, a perspective as well as like a, a full lifestyle approach. You know, just like kind of like you said before. You know, focusing on the things that you can actually control and letting go of the things you can't. You know, the the mm. classic saying, right? Like, give me the strength to know what I can and the the what is it the serenity to know the difference. I, I'm not, not really saying it properly, but most people have probably heard that phrase before. So I think there's that. Um, and otherwise, you know, like I, I look to make sure I consistently get enough calories and variety of quality food. Cause that actually does make a difference. Um, I, I look to get enough sleep and, you know, more if I want it or need it. Uh, I make sure to move and exercise and do the things I absolutely love, like skateboarding and, you know, spend time with friends, but also at the same time, give myself enough self time, you know, and mm. all of that stuff, stuff uh, really helps balance. You know, I mean, I could, of course, say like yoga and uh, breath work and stuff like that. But I, it is the, the whole package, you know, all of those different things. And I also allow myself to be stressed, you know. So it's like if I'm experiencing stress, I don't feel guilty about it. I don't think that I'm wrong or bad. I experience it and, and try to embody it and release it, you know. And 
whether that's mm. through exercise or whether that's through venting and talking to someone um, or whether that's just through kind of breathing through it and kind of going through an intellectual process of, again, kind of coming back to, can I control this? Is this something that is worth stressing over? Um, you know, because the reality is most of our stress is outside the current moment, you know, and so if we can come back to the present moment and is this real or is this just something I'm freaking out about? Okay, well, what can I do now? You know, it always just comes back to what can I do now? You know, so um, mm. that's that's generally what I do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, often when we're stressed, we're focusing on the past or the future. It's never yeah. the present moment. <laughs> it's always what yeah. went wrong or what's missing or what could go wrong. It's funny. Yeah. 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 It's just the this mind. fear based, right? And if you can come back to gratitude for what is, I have my breath, I have my body, you know, mm. I have endless opportunity right now. What do I want to create? You know, just coming back to that. Also. Mm. Yeah. That's why I like people when I gravitate towards people who are upbeat and they have a more proactive approach and less fear based and they their message is empowering rather than like you know this is why you're failing um blah 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 buy this <laughs> I, I much rather yeah i much prefer the the empowering approach and i think i think that's what you've done a good job good job of over the years um but over the years are there any things that have changed like for you personally like um because obviously you let new information comes up personal experiences are there any like major like pivots or yeah things that have changed in your mind and uh routine um, you know i mean i could go a couple different ways with that i mean uh, food and diet wise um a condensed kind of history would kind of be like you know in the beginning it was like super strict hygiene and thinking mm -hmm. that there's a right and wrong way to do it and not doing it perfectly will vastly impact my overall not only health, but also my ability to create what I want and be successful. Um, so, uh, you know, for about five years, I was very strict hygienic. Like I didn't have an onion or a garlic or a hot pepper or any spice besides like cinnamon and carob. And I thought, you know, cacao was the devil and I'd you know, be evil if I had a, a little bit of that or this and that, you know, and um, it was great. I, I'm not actually knocking that. I think it was really beneficial. I felt really, really good and streamlined. Um, but I was in my mind a little bit more black and white, again, success, failure about it. And it did create stress in some moments, you know, there was times where I was just, this feels the best. I enjoy this the most. And it wasn't like I was denying myself anything, you know, I was just like, this is what I want. And it feels amazing, you know, which I think is beautiful. Um, but at some point I genuinely wanted to experiment outside of that. And it was creating some resistance in me because I was like, no, that's wrong. I can't do that. Or I shouldn't do that, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, I let go of that and recognize like, to me, there is no should, or there is nothing that I could eat that would make me better or worse. Uh, and I don't think that it impacts me quite as much as that black and white success or failure, you know? And so I softened and I started in part also creating recipes that were a little bit more what I consider transitional and may appeal to a larger audience and uh, help people in those times where they want something different or, they're just genuinely uh, want a wider kind of spread of ingredients and foods, you know? So, um, mm. that led me to experimenting more and trying a bunch of things and feeling in my body, how much of that was still great and beneficial and how much of that brought me away from how good I did feel when I was just totally simple and hygienic. And I'd say since then I go through periods of time where I am simpler and just, you know, fruit and tender greens. And then I go through times where I experiment and make different recipes and, I go through times where, you know, life's a little harder and emotional and I lean into those, some of those foods and <laughs> even though I have coping mechanisms and stuff like that, um, you know, there are times where I still utilize food to some degree as a little bit of comfort mm. and a little bit of, uh, excitement and, and party and, and, you know, experiences with other people sharing it and stuff like that. So, um, you know, and then there's times where I choose no matter what situation I'm in just to be like really simple and whether it's mono or a smoothie. Right. So I, I feel like I've gotten a little bit more flexible. Um, mm. but at the same time, really honoring myself and what I want and not having limitations of should can't, you know, anything like that. It's like, I can have whatever I want. It's just choice and experience. What do I want to experience? And, um, being more aware of the outcomes of my choices. And for me, that has been really helpful. Um, one other thing that actually really was a big shift for me was recognizing that, you know, once I'm eating fruits and vegetables and that's like the mainstay of my diet and I'm enjoying what I really genuinely enjoy and having some different uh, variety over the seasons, 
that I don't really have to worry about nutrition. You know, it's like, especially once I've been consistent for a couple of years and my body weight is consistent and I'm not getting symptoms of anything weird. It's like I can let go of nutrition and just focus on what do I genuinely enjoy the most and just have fun and focus on things outside of the diet. You know, cause it's like for a long period of time, I was raw food, Chris, and it's like, I'm doing it for raw food. And like, you know, that's my identity. And now it's like, I just, I just eat raw food and it feels amazing, but I, I, that's not who I am. And I'm not Chris skateboarder and I'm not, you know, Chris Yogi. It's like, these are all things I like to do to experience uh, and shape my reality, you know? So um, that's made things a lot easier and actually catapulted my health to another level, to be honest, you know, just being more relaxed and focus mm-hmm. again, kind of more on creating and, and what I enjoy rather than uh, hyper-focusing on any one aspect of health, you know, be it food or anything else. And uh, yeah, what else? Oh, and then I guess a big one, outside of that kind of stuff would be uh, major accidents I've had, you know, like I fractured my back since I've been a raw foodist, uh, fractured my back and also was in a mo- major motorcycle accident, both totally separate and like a decade apart. And that was really, really hard uh, mentally, emotionally, you know, like both of those accidents, I thought I might never skateboard again or be able to move in the way that uh, I feel really blessed to with my body, you know, and um, I, I definitely, like I talked about identities and stuff like that. Uh, I definitely identified as a skateboarder and as a good skateboarder and felt like, you know, some people looked up to me for that or maybe wouldn't care about me as much if I wasn't that, you know, so it was like uh, a pretty harsh reckoning with how I perceive myself and my reality and my friends and family even and stuff like that. And it was uh, really, really tough, but it also brought on a lot of growth and just kind of being more centered in, you know, the unchanging spirit of who I am and again focusing more on what I'm creating and letting go and just trying to be a present in the moment and do what I can just what can I do right and uh, Mm. very very luckily you know it's led me to feeling really really good and still skateboarding and stuff but I did come to more peace that if I couldn't ever do that again I could still enjoy life because there's definitely times in my life it's almost embarrassing to admit but there's definitely been times in my life where I felt like if I couldn't skateboard I wouldn't want to live anymore you know so so um, mm-hmm. I'm happy to not be through, not be in that anymore, but it also makes me really cherish and enjoy and uh, feel so grateful for it, you know, uh, mm. because I still can. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think grat- gratitude is key. Like definitely. Yeah. I think I can imagine Well, I can't imagine, but having a, like an experience like that, I don't, I, you know, I can only, I can only imagine that it would make you really grateful for the things you you can do like um yeah i think obviously when you're new to the lifestyle you almost feel like it's a magic pill or bullet or like you're invincible like (laughs) don't get me wrong like it it, in my experience it's enhanced my life in many ways and i'm sure it probably sped up your recovery but like you say there's so many other aspects to health just like emotional poise and gratitude like do you, do you feel like gratitude is, is a is a big part of your just whole way of being? You... Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's something to remember and remind oneself when it slips, you know, because mm. um, some people say like, oh, you're the happiest person I know or this or that. And it's like, well, I don't think so. You know, I've, I've met other people who make me feel like a rain cloud, you know, and, um, and, you know, whether you live on social media or not, you know, everyone doesn't see everything and you don't voice every single uh, darkness or like mm, challenge you go through, right? Um, but coming back to that and, you know, always recognizing how, how freaking lucky we have it. You know, I mean, if you're on a computer right now, you know, if you have a phone in your pocket, if you, if you have a place to sleep, if you, you know, if you have regular food and you have options, you know, it's like, you're freaking blessed, like so freaking blessed, you know, like, and so I, I absolutely 100% do know and believe that because, you know, I've met this kind of goes a little bit outside of that, but it's in the same thing. I've met, uh, you know, raw foodists who, they have everything going for them, you know, but you can just tell that there is something that they're like hyper focused on and, you know, not happy or, you know, taking things really black and white or Mm. are really judgmental of others, which indicates they're very judgmental of themselves and they're nowhere near thriving. Like you can tell that they have, you know, visually they look less healthy than just the standard person walking down the street. And, Mm. you know, it's, it, it is so much mindset and perspective and gratitude and again, what you're focusing on, right? What you're consuming, you know, and that goes far beyond just food, you know, so, um, and consuming can be your thoughts, you know, you can be consuming 
negative thoughts and uh, that can have as much impact or more, I'd actually say, than eating foods that some people would deem poisonous, you know? So mm. I think it's a really, absolutely. really big thing for sure. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. I think uh, external reality is often a projection and a reflection of our internal state and kind of get back what we put out ourselves. Yeah, I think. Absolutely. Mm, I agree. Absolutely. Mm. Yep. And I, I would probably say for me in the last 20 years, my biggest challenges more have been that, that reality, you know, like when I've had those really challenging moments and mm. like second guessed everything and wasn't grounded in, in gratitude all the time or was more in fear, you know, and stuff like that. Um, I think that has caused more uh, physical manifestation than, you know, food choice, you know? Mm absolutely yeah yeah i think it's it's just balancing all the wheels of health all the pillars of health on the, on the kind of flywheel yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. um but I, I do notice a lot of in my mind especially like people i know a lot of kind of preventable cases of like i don't know depression or low mood and things like that mm-hmm. and in my mind it's quite clear like it's, it's the brain and gut link um mm-hmm. do you how how yeah. What, what would you, do you have any advice to anyone um, who's maybe going through it and they're, they're not sure where to start with like a raw food diet or healthier choices? Are there any kind of, you know, is there any kind of generic advice you'd give someone just to, to start making healthier changes? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different avenues you could go with <laughs> yeah. that. You know, I mean, food wise, I, w- I would say, um, you know, start with fruit for breakfast, you know, start with fruit for breakfast. And if you want, you know, if you're going towards all raw food, then maybe fruit and salad or fruit for lunch as well and start your dinner with fruit and then have a big veggie meal, whether it's raw or cooked, you know, lightly steamed veggies or something like that, whatever your preference is. Mm -hmm. Um, And a a big thing that I, I think can be really, really beneficial as well is to make peace with the moment, you know, so, and all I'm meaning with that is like, when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling discord, feel it, you know, like mm-hmm. accept it and um, make make a habit of eating when you're calm and balanced. You know, I think a lot of people mistake mm-hmm. symptoms uh, that are outside of actual need for hunger as hunger, you know, so like uh, if you're feeling like anxious or like, you know, urgent for a food or you're just feeling lots of emotion and you just want to eat something heavy except you're feeling that and, and, you know, like look into why you're feeling like, have I not eaten enough? Is like something stressful in my life happened or, or whatever it may be, but just sip on some water and take a walk or contemplate or talk with a friend until that passes and come to a, a calm, even state before choosing to eat. And to me, just that one thing, actually independent of what you choose to eat, actually doesn't, you know, obviously we're talking about raw food and you know veganism, but independent of that, it can make a huge impact. Cause again, that's like building upon a good relation with your relationship with yourself and food and, uh, you know, choosing to feel what you feel and, and eat when your body's actually ready for it. Because if you eat when you're stressed out, well, you're not going to be able to absorb or digest it as well, you know? And it, the yeah. way I look at it is actually like, you're wasting money, you're wasting time, you're wasting vitality, you know, and, and you're not accepting the reality of the moment. And, you know, life is tough and it is stress, you know, but, uh, you know, we're much more even kiltered if we accept it, you know, it's like what we resist persists. I mean, it's a common saying, right? But if we like resist the stress and resist the feelings within us and, and just shovel food on top of it, we're just pushing it down and it can get stinkier and worse and more challenging and it comes up more and more. Um, but I, I find, yeah, making peace of the moment and, you know, choosing to eat in gratitude and a calm, balanced state is, is huge, you know? So, mm-hmm. I mean, we could go into so many things though, right? We could go into like, you know, get some movement to like start your day with some movement, whether it's taking a walk or some rebounding, have some water. And then, you know, again, coming to eat when you're calm and balanced rather than just waking up and just shoveling food in your mouth, you know? Um, mm. You know, we could talk about gratitude and, uh, you know, writing things down or prayer or uh, all those different types of things, you know? Um, ho'oponopono or nonviolent communication, mm. you know, all these different things can be really, really helpful for our self talk and for our view on reality. Uh, but definitely, yeah, hopefully some of those connect with people. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there's quite a wide, wide range of places people could start there. I think, yeah, it's just about tackling maybe one thing that, that you feel like maybe is an area in your life that's not lacking, but maybe just 
could do with a little bit of energy put into. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as and, they say, you know, you're, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if, yeah, if you can identify mm. your weakest link, you'll get more growth out of focusing on that than trying to overanalyze the thing you're already strong at. And to me, that kind of goes back to like, when you're already eating a fruit and vegetable based diet and you're enjoying it and stuff. Yeah. Maybe it's time to shuffle in, and put a little bit more thought and attention to the other aspects of health rather than just nailing mm. raw food, raw food, raw food, and trying to like, you know, be black and white perfect, you know? Mm. Yeah. That's, the, that's the human mind, isn't it? And the mentalization of just always feeling like there's something wrong or something could, could be improved like like looking for something like oh maybe it's my diet something like that but like you say if you've got that base covered it's, it's probably other other factors um for you personally what's like what would be like a ideal day for you like what would be your ideal day flow like what time would you get up and what, what kind of things would you <laughs> ideal I, I laugh because you know i thought for a second you're gonna ask like what's something you could tighten up and for me i could <laughs> go to bed a bit earlier and wake up a little earlier but the funny thing is like, I mean, you know, I'm self-employed, so I make my own schedule and, you know, most of my friends work during the day. So it's not like I, you know, need to wake up to go meet up with friends and stuff. Um, but I mean, my ideal day, typically, like, I mean, I, I very honestly typically go to bed sometime between midnight and two usually, but it'd probably be more beneficial. Actually, I know it would be in some ways uh, to maybe go to bed instead between 10 and midnight. Um, but uh, did you say optimal or, or reality? Yeah, like ideal. Yeah, like ideal, okay, what, yeah. what the flow so looks ideal, like. Ideal, yeah. I, I'd say ideal, say I'm in bed by 11 and, and asleep by midnight, um, awake by around 8. I kind of like that time. You know, I like to get 8 hours or 9 some nights uh, if I can and not less than 7, ideally. Uh, but I like to wake up and it's kind of funny. It's not what most people recommend, but I actually, I like to wake up and just check some of my main things, you know, whether that's social media or, or my emails and just quickly brush away the things that I can do pretty quickly, like little things I can answer so that my plates clean, you know? Uh, and then I like to get up, have some water, jump on my rebounder and, or go to the gym. Often I start on the rebounder, then I go to the gym. Uh, then I come back and make a breakfast and or lunch, depending on what time it is. And then I usually sit to the computer and uh, finish the other stuff that I could just quickly do in the morning. And uh, after that, I, I ideally would like to go skateboarding before dinner and then come back, have dinner and chill out with some friends uh, or loved one and my cat and uh, cats and, uh, you know, watch a show or do more creative stuff on the internet, you know, whether it's hmm. a posting or a big project that I have and then kind of just repeat the cycle uh, before bed, I like to do some yoga, some stretching, take a nice hot bath, you know, and, uh, and then, yeah, then chill out and go to sleep. So just politely jumping in to share that if you want my exact workout routine that took me from 130 pounds after a lot of cleansing and fasting to 156 pounds over the course of about six months now, then you can find that top link in the description and that's completely free. But anyway, enjoy the rest of the conversation. Peace and love. Mm. Pretty darn simple. Yeah. Definitely. And I think ideal is so subjective as well. Cause like yeah. there's so, so many of these routines online. It's like, you know, go to bed at nine, wake up at five, cold shower, meditate. And it's like, it's great if, if, if you need that to do, I don't know, whatever you want to do, but I think everyone's interests and desires and passions and yeah, that their ideal day is so different. And I think it's yeah. just about picking and choosing what works for you and, because often we're looking for external validation or information or, or, or like, like this is the right way. But I think, have you, have you found personally, it's like a, more of a journey of self discovery? Like how have you kind of found your balance and yeah, what, what you like most? Yeah, I, I'd say it would be just trial, trial and error and just being really honest mm -hmm. with oneself, you know, and I mean, that's part of the reason too, why I like, I'll, I'll be straight up and saying like, yeah, it's like I go to bed a little bit late or, you know, I, I do the social media in the morning, which people like, that's not like optimal or seen as something you'd promote as, you know, and I'm not trying to say like everyone should do that, but it's like, no, no. I, I, I like night more than morning, you know, like it, it is my favorite time. It seems like more relaxed and I feel more creative and just more at ease and peace at night. And, um, so I, I do like often to stay up a little bit later and I love bed and I love sleeping in like, yeah, it can be nice. Like this morning, I got up at seven thirty, but uh, you know, I enjoy the days that I stay in bed until nine more. You know, so um, yeah. So I, I think 
I like to have flexibility and I, I like to, you know, just move what the moment is, have some structure, but not by be stuck by it. You know, it's like, I think sometimes people have a, a structure of like what is optimal and, and force themselves into it. And if they go outside of that, then they have actually more stress. And I like to have a structure, but be fluid and be relaxed with whatever comes. And even though I might have this and this on the day, if, if the day comes and it's, if that doesn't work, that's not what is actually um, in the cards, then not be worried or worked up about it. You know, it's like, it's, it's to me kind of like this, like um, yoga, for example, you know, some people, they have to do an hour practice every day. And if they miss one class of yoga, they're all stressed out. And they say like they're thrown off for a week. And it's like, mm. I think we missed the point of yoga here. You know, it's like, <laughs> if yeah, you get what yeah. I'm saying anyway. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. No, I fully, I fully hear, fully hear that. Um, yeah. I think the rigidity and like you said, often misses the point. Um, just having that fluidity and flexibility, just for me personally, I've yeah. noticed has benefited me because I'm quite yeah. rigid in my structure, but just having that slight adaptability and things like that for me personally, it's, it's been beneficial. Yeah. yeah, me too. And it makes things much more easy. I mean, I think if I could distill it into like kind of an ideal day, you know, kind of what you're mm -hmm. saying before is like, you know, get adequate sleep you know, get some movement before major meals and have some time for creativity and have some time for connection, you know, and it, mm. those are the main things and what that looks like can change, you know, and some days I don't meet all of those perfectly. Um, but that'd be like the main kind of frame of what I what I aim to to do because that, that brings about more balance and happiness and mm. overall health. Definitely. Yeah, it's definitely balance. Um, yeah. And I do apologize to my audience because I haven't asked all your questions yet. But if you've got time for um, a few more, we'll reel them off quick. Of yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not stressed about it. So you can we can do as many as you like. If you have if you have more, we can awesome. go for longer. You can split this into two if you want. Doesn't matter to me. Awesome. Yeah, we'll just roll, reel off as many as we can. Um, so yeah, what kind of detox symptoms did you experience in the beginning, and what do you recommend to people who want to get started? Is going cold turkey uh, turkey problematic for everyone? So yeah, your your detox um, experience and what you'd recommend well, the, the for funny transition. Thing is like, yeah, I had a, like a four and a half year transition from you know like cigarettes and bacon double cheeseburger pizzas and drinking every night to high raw vegan. Like that's four and a half years, and mm -hmm. during that period of time, I did multiple uh, one to three to five day fasts, um, and I did a couple cleanses. You know, like with like. I remember my first cleanse was just a whole food vegan cleanse. It was not all raw food. You know, I did that for, it was supposed to be two weeks, but my mom cooked a, a big thing of baklava, my favorite dessert right in the middle. I was uh, like, yeah. you've never made baklava for me. Like, except for my first <laughs> page. She's like, oh, you, I felt bad for you. Like, so anyway, anyways, a funny story. But um, I mean, I mean, the common ones, and it, it seems so long ago, like, a, you know, some headache, uh, some lethargy, um, some little random aches and pains, um, the re requirement for more sleep, you know, just feeling like I need to sleep more, um, you know, all those kinds of things would be the, the main thing. Like, you know, in the last 20 years, it's been kind of rare that I've had major symptoms like that, you know, it, it, the cleaner and cleaner over that period of time, my diet got, and the more I just focused on well-rounded health, uh, the less detox symptoms I got. Um, but I mean, I just actually did a, an eight day water fast and there's one day where I had a little bit of a mild headache just for a little bit of a time, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and I mean, yeah, there's, our body's always going through cycles, you know, like we're always detoxifying, you know, but there can be periods of time where our body goes a little bit deeper, you know, whether that's seasonal, whether that's energetic or whether that's based on how much you're eating or what you're eating, you know, that can be a bit of a variable between all of those things, I think. Um, but again, for me, it, it kind of comes back to that, uh, accepting the moment and what can I do now? And, and a lot of the time it's just like breathing, sipping water and doing light movement, you know, walking, you know, so we're like bouncing mm -hmm. on the rebounder, you know? Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but, uh, yeah, I yeah. think, uh, just patience and, and trust in the body and just giving it what it requires, just, you know, upping the sleep, uh, making sure you're well hydrated, getting some movement and connection, all those things just facilitate, uh, more streamlining of that process mm, definitely yeah so it was a gradual approach it was the same for me like vegan six year or probably four years at the time before i found this lifestyle and then it was just a bit more gradual i think mm. that's personally what i prefer as well so yeah. just for, for for someone just incorporate more uh raw foods more fruit more 
Yeah, I guess kind of, like, of going into stuff. because they didn't really answer the uh, the culture no, kind of aspect. It's I I find you know like uh, like I've been doing this coaching for seventeen years and um, I I find it's quite rare, like quite rare, like almost unheard of, but not quite. I've heard one or two people kind of say it uh, of someone to just like go from let's say a, a regular sad lifestyle just overnight, one hundred percent raw and no looking back ever. You know it's it's very rare. Um, most people require some transition, whether that means, you know, they go vegetarian, then vegan, then high raw, then raw vegan. I mean, it, it isn't always that, you know, like those, all those steps needed. People can generally jump some steps, especially in this day yeah. and age with the availability that we have for everything. Um, but for the vast majority of people having some transition and, or at the very least, even if they want to just dive full in, which I know a lot of people, I kind of kind of did. I mean, I went high raw, then I dive, dove in. So I, was, I guess I was high raw vegan for six months and then I went 100% raw. Um, but I, I think one of the main messages I'd like to bring and, and to share and uh, instill in people in the community is like have, have an aim, uh, but also be flexible and super patient and super forgiving and super loving with yourself. Because mm. this, even though it like conceptually, it's like, oh, well, this is, this makes sense. This is the best thing It's best for the diet is be, you know, best for the planet is best for the animals, you know, like, uh, just eat fruits and vegetables, you know, like life's a little bit different, you know, it's a little bit harder than that. You know, whether we're talking social, emotional, um, you know, physical ramifications of this lifestyle change, you know, like all those different things, you know, like. I find most people the proverbial shit needs to hit the fan a couple times and have them kind of go off track to experience that and to become mm. even more rooted in the experiential knowledge that this not only makes the most sense, but it, it feels the best and it leads to the, the most uh, streamlined outcome to want to choose it in all of those situations and scenarios. Uh, so again, it's just like, even when people go kind of uh, cold turkey, usually they still kind of go through some transition and they have some slip ups or they have some periods of time where they're, you know, not too sure or, you know, they feel like, oh, I just need extra comfort. So I'm going to do this or I'm going to hide and do that and feel guilty about it or whatever it may be, you know, which is, is common. It's very common. Mm. Um, but I, what I found is, again, the more patient, the more accepting, uh, the more you know, you can be in the moment and breathing into what is and accepting uh, whatever you feel, uh, the more streamlined, you know, the more balanced and uh, the easier that process is to get to the point where, yeah, you just want to choose it in every moment. And if you don't, well, that's just what is and you can get back on the horse the next day and it's not the end of the world. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think just being gentle to yourself, like you say, and, and if you do like, quote unquote fail <laughs> which is never a failure it's just a, a, yeah. a lesson or something to learn and you have a certain experience and it's not so good then you just like you say you get back on it and you just you ultimately want to do what feels best for you and your body so that's also what I found especially during the transition like I'd have maybe a more denser food and then I'd be like oh I don't actually feel too great um, then I'd actually want to get back to the kind of healthier raw foods so, yeah yeah it's just, I mean, yeah, I, I used to think in the terms of like failure, success, you know, and it, mm. instead I, I, I like the, it's choice and experience, you know, and like, if you're going to mm. make a choice, like make it a meditation, like be completely present, you know, and, and try and let go and leave all judgments and preconceived notions at the door and just be totally there, you know, like experience it. Cause I, I really do believe we're experiential beings and anything we truly want, you know, anything that comes up and like we really want, if we don't experience it, we're resisting it. And it's just going to knock louder and louder and louder until we don't feel like we're choosing. We feel like we're forced into it. And so mm -hmm. instead, if we're, we're calm and patient and uh, again, really meditative or just in the moment with it, uh, accepting with it and letting go of again, any of those judgments, we're much more likely to truly experience it. And from there, know if it's something we want to keep or something we want to let go. And in my experience specifically with food is when we do that, we have a more streamlined place of coming to like, this is what I want, not that I think I should do it, you know? And it's like um, less yo-yoing and instead just kind of more streamlined uh, towards that that goal. Mm, 
Absolutely, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's for most people, unless they're severely chronically ill. It's it's not. It's really not a sprint. It's not like a huge race. Like who can get there first? Who can go raw overnight? <laughs> like yeah. we're we're in it for the long game, the long term. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that way. And I mean, I I know people who they've found their balance high raw, and they feel they feel great. They love that. You know, they like some flexibility. They might be all raw almost all the time, but mm-hmm. on an odd social occasion, they do that. And I know other people, such as myself, who would choose not to do that because it's just it feels like a bit of a roller coaster. Even being at ease with those choices, you, you still notice the ramifications of them. So it's like I think it's all up to the individual and not making mm. one better, worse, or individual better or worse. It's just you know what serves you and what helps you create in your life what you want to create. You know, let mm. people uh, let people obsess about things if they want to, but again, for you, what what's best for you? You know, and, and enjoy it. And I know that yeah. it can always change, right? It's like, we like to like reach an end point of perfection and think that, you know, like I'm just going to hold on to this perfection. And it's like, to me, perfection is fluid. You know, it's a, it's a never ending process. You know, I, I, I don't think it's a static end point, you know? So mm. to me, that also brings more relaxation and ease and balance in my mind, in my heart and in my reality. Definitely. Yeah. Just comes back to know thyself and yeah, yeah what's right for you um so yeah you touched on obviously your water fast uh recently um someone commented um have you done much water fasting and do you ever supplement electrolytes or or do you like yeah kind of monitor those levels when you fast yeah so it's kind of funny because um before going raw i did more water fasting like that four and a half year period of transitioning like i i i I believe I did, I'd have to like really think, but I, I believe I did around between seven to 10 different water fasts in that four and a half period, uh, four and a half year period that again, they ranged from some one day, some three day, some five day. And I, I believe it was about a seven or eight day that I did was the longest at that time. And then how many years into my raw food? I was, uh, I think seven or eight years into my raw food. Uh, like those first, those first years when I was all raw, I, I didn't really feel much of a need to fast. If I did any, it was a very short one. And I did a 11, 12, 12 day water fast. Uh, you know, like my, I think it was on my seventh year, 2011, mm-hmm. uh, at the farm life in Costa Rica. And, uh, that was, you know, a pretty major one. And then since then though, so it's been, I guess like 12 years since then, I've only done a few, maybe a handful of like one day fasts where I just like skipped a day. Um, I don't think I went more than one day in the last 12 years. Uh, I have definitely though done like periods of time where I just ate, you know, mono for a couple of days on one or two fruits or I, you know, created the, the rainbow Island cleanse, which is just a really simplified program of just basically mono meals and or greens with it. So I've done kind of those kind of simplified eating windows at times when I felt like I needed a little bit of a boost uh, mm-hmm. or just streamlining, you know, whether it's digestion or, kind of mental, emotional kind of state. Um, but then, yeah, I just, I kind of took a little bit of time off everything. It's like the longest break I've ever had, uh, on social media, which I still was actually a little present. I was still doing stories and still occasional posting, but for me, it was a relative break almost Mm -hmm. for a month. Actually, I'm still, I feel like I'm still kind of just kind of perking up from that, you know? Uh, and during that time I was just like, I don't have any major major things I need to do. I don't have many major responsibilities. It's like the weather's amazing. And I actually just was like, I don't feel like eating. And I, I just lost the desire to body initiated fast. Where I was just like, this is perfect. And so I, I took time off and it was, uh, uh, seven full days broken on the eighth day, I think, or eight full days broken. No, seven and eight. And, uh, it was a great experience. Um, fully different from all my other fasts. You know, I think just the place I'm in, it wasn't, uh, wasn't quite as like, um, perspective changing, life changing by any means. Like, you know, and it was really easy. Like it was, it was genuinely really, really easy. And, and like I said, I had like a minor headache one of the days, but otherwise it was really easy and, and fun. And I did gain some really nice benefits from it, uh, body wise and, and excitement wise. And, uh, all those kinds of things kind of brought me back into like even more excitement to bring more to the table and to, you know, create more and stuff like that. So, um, it was really beneficial, um, with electrolytes. No, I, I don't, I don't worry about that when I'm water fasting myself. Um, I, I don't promote people to water fast by themselves, you know, especially if they've never water fast before, because 
I have a lot of experience with it. I have close friends who are really well experienced water fasting practitioners that if I needed to, I could call and talk to, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. I feel very safe. And also, of course, I'm overall really healthy and, and stuff like that. So I didn't have any concerns for myself, but um, anyone who's contemplating fasting, especially if they don't have any experience with it, uh, I, I would recommend either going to a center or at the very least, you know, being in contact with a, a fasting coach and getting their personalized advice because it's, it's not one of those things that's just like everyone should do it and don't even think twice about anything. You know, it's a, you know, you want to be uh, safe and uh, honor your previous history, lifestyle history and your knowledge level and all that kind of stuff. Mm, yeah, exactly. Everyone's so unique and individualized. Like you say, they have they have previous history. Um, yeah. And, um, just, t t I had a little thought about sodium when you were talking about that. So obviously like that's usually the main concern for people. Um, I've, I've seen some people say they benefit from adding in, um, like various different salts, not, not table salt, but like, um, Himalayan salt or yeah, just Celtic sea salt. What's your personal experience with sodium and on a raw food diet? Well, you know, something interesting with that is, um, you know, if, if we're used to eating sodium, if we're used to eating salt, uh, then our body throws off significantly more sodium, especially if, you know, you're active and sweating or doing anything like that. And, and people recognize that because if you eat salt then when you sweat, it, it can sting your eyes and you can get like salt circles on your clothing and like it's, it's really noticeable. And it actually takes a while for your body to switch into sodium sparing. It can take up to three months completely salt free before you get to a wow. point where your body really sodium spares. And this is actually really important to note because if you're an athlete and you're getting into raw food and you automatically go from like, oh, well, I eat salt and stuff to completely sodium free, um, you can run into electrolyte imbalances and it actually could potentially be even fatal if you're doing something like say, you know, ultra endurance events and you didn't carry salt with you and you just, you know, your, your body isn't sodium sparing is throwing off a whole bunch and you're out in the forest, like running full blast, just sweating and sweating and you can get to a crazy imbalance and cramp up and like pass out, you know, it's like, so being aware of that can be very important. And if you're transitioning and you're still training and stuff like that, having some higher natural sodium, uh, foods and or drinks on hand. So whether that's like carrying around some celery or, having some celery juice or even having like, you know, a sports drink that has some, you know, like soaked dates and some sticks of celery or celery juice in it. Mm -hmm. um, tomatoes, stuff like that. I mean, tomatoes while you're running is a little harder than carrying a couple of celery sticks, mm -hmm. but having all that kind of stuff can actually help you uh, balance out. And I find if people are really looking to give up sodium and, uh, you know, not sodium, sodium is required, but salt, you know, uh, concentrated, then uh, it can be beneficial to do things like have celery juice in the morning, you know, or make sure you're incorporating more greens and or uh, salty veggies like the tomatoes and stuff like that it can really, really help with salt cravings. And mm. it, it is kind of the, the simplest kind of measure with uh, sodium intake. Like there's 100% definitively no need to, to take salt in, you know, like uh, the largest amount of time we've been on this planet, we didn't take in salt. Uh, at least not like in rock form. And we can actually see that by fossil records and bone records. You know, we can, we can date approximately when people started adding like external sodium sources to their diet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it is an important, uh, sodium is an important mineral. We, we need enough of it. And that's why our tastes are so receptive to it and why it's so stimulating when we get it in a concentrated source, because, you know, without that concentrated source, we are driven towards greens and, and sodium rich plants. And, and again, it's an, it's an easy measure. You're not getting enough sodium. If you're thinking about salt, you know, if you're, if you're eating enough greens, the sodium cravings go away. You know, if you're eating enough greens and tomatoes and, you know, even coconut water, you know, if you're fortunate mm -hmm. enough to live somewhere, you can get a lot of coconut water. There's a decent amount of sodium in there. Um, so, all this to say, that's kind of like the, I think the groundwork of that, you know, if you, if you want to be sodium free, I think there is salt free, sorry. I think there is more benefit to being salt free and getting adequate amounts of sodium and all the other minerals and, and trace minerals and stuff like that from eating a well-rounded diet consisting of fruits and tender greens and whatever else you want to have, maybe some seaweeds, whatever. That's obviously going to have more sodium too. Um, 
I think there's much more benefit to getting enough sodium from whole plant foods rather than the addition of, uh, you know, Celtic salt or Himalayan salt or whatever kind of salt you, you want, you know, um, yeah, sure. They, they have trace minerals, you know, yeah, sure. They're a, a, a concentrated sodium source that just like say coffee or cigarettes, people will make up anything to try and say it's like the best and they need it because it's a stimulation and a habit that, uh, that people want to hold on to, you know, um, but they're not taking into account the, uh, one, the stimulatory nature, the deadening nature to the taste buds, the effect on the microbiome and on the stomach. Uh, they're not taking into account uh, how it raises your blood pressure and hardens arterial walls. Um, and how most people, when they consume it, they steadily, slowly consume more and more and more and more. And there are like numerous health implications. They're often also not considering that all of the minerals in all of those that they tout so highly one, are in such minute quantities compared to the amount of nutrients we get from our foods that they're, they're not necessary for eating a whole food diet, um, but also that they're in inorganic form. And while I used to be more black and white with it, that like our body can't utilize inorganic minerals at all and it's just toxic to the body, like that's not totally true. The body can to some extent, but it's not its preferred source. And there is information that it can harden and get stuck in joints uh, and calcify and um, irritate and, uh, you know, cause other negative symptoms from it as well. So, um, yeah, the people I think that have seen benefit from adding that one is the stimulatory nature and two, they're, they weren't getting enough from their diet before that. And, um, I don't think it's something that's going to make or break. So I'm not trying to make this like, Oh my God, if you have salt, you're the devil, you know, it's like, but in the best, better kind of scenario, I, I would, I would be abstaining from it. Um, and aiming to get enough from whole plant foods so that you're not craving salt. And then at the same time, for me, I've, I've had periods where I was completely salt free. And I've had periods of time where I only ever had it if I was like at a raw restaurant or something served something. And then I've had periods of times where I'd buy spice that said salt on the last thing and I didn't care, you know, and had that on occasion as well. But I always recognize that when it sneaks in, especially if it sneaks in with something that is in the house. I do want more of it and I want more of it and I don't get benefit from it. I actually get detriment that I can totally tell. So mm. hopefully that kind of covers the whole salt story. But, but again, if it's like the, the make or break thing, what I'd just say there too is like, if that helps somebody to stay, you know, all raw or stay happy and balanced and enjoy their diet a ton, I don't think, again, I don't think it's going to make or break if it's a small amount, but I think you're kidding yourself if you think it's necessary or better to have it. You know, I think it's better instead to be focusing on the whole foods and or even like green juices. You know, like I said, I've, I've coached some people who really wanted to get rid of it. And the only way that they could totally let go of salt was to have like a green juice in the morning as their first meal. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of bases there. Um, it's definitely true. It's very addictive. Um, and yeah. a little goes a long way. It's very, very, very easy to overdo it. Um, yeah if you want um maybe a quick pee break and then we'll just finish with the final final few if that, if that for sure good man yeah you. so we're back and <laughs> you talked earlier about tomatoes and that made me think about um nightshades i had a question on nightshades how do you feel about nightshades because there's a lot of mixed information about them yeah yeah uh, I, I love nightshades taste wise um I don't, I'm not afraid of them, nor do I think that they're uh, harmful to everyone. I, in my consulting experience, it's, it's a very small percentage of people that actually have an issue with nightshades and get symptoms from it, and a larger percentage that fear symptoms of it and avoid it. Um, but even still, it's like a, you know, like I find it's like very single digits uh, in the percentage of people that really have symptoms from having it, and maybe low double digits of people who avoid it because they are concerned about that. Um, some people say that even if you don't have symptoms, it's causing damage. I haven't seen any real scientific or clinical evidence really supporting that. Um, you know, but I mean, they are, they do also contain free glutamate, you know, which is, uh, you know, similar to MSG, but in its natural form, doesn't have the detriment to it. It's just very like, wow, like umami flavor, delicious, you know? So, uh, I've gone periods of time without, uh, I've gone periods of time having tons um, and I've had periods of time having smaller amounts. And the one thing I can say is if I have tons, 
Um, I get a little bit of water retention, which kind of makes sense. You know, more, more sodium can throw the sodium potassium balance out a little bit. Um, one time I ate just tomatoes for an entire day and my ankle swole, swole up and, uh, but that was like 20 some pounds of tomatoes in one day. Wow. <laughs> I was trying to get all my count. I think I, I think it was, I can't remember if it was 23 or 27 pounds of tomato in one day. It was all I ate, just wow. mono ate the best heirloom tomatoes ever that were perfectly ripe. And I got a really good deal on, but I, yeah, I actually got like swollen ankles and felt lethargic and tired. Um, and what I've basically actually for myself found, if I have more than about five or six pounds of tomatoes in a day, uh, I get a little bit of the runs and I don't feel quite as peppy. But if I have a couple pounds, then I really like it. So, I mean, if that tells you that, you know, there's some negative qualities or if it just tells you that having excess of certain nutrients has some ramifications as well as anything would, um, to me, that's what it tells me. So um, I, I, I love them enough that, like, like I said, I, I go periods of time without them sometimes just when they're poor quality uh, or really expensive. Um, before I used to think if I couldn't have tomatoes, I couldn't be a raw foodist, you know, but, uh, I don't feel that way anymore, but I really genuinely enjoy them. And I think they're a, a fun and delicious part of the lifestyle that to me, doesn't need to be feared. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, like you say, m most people are not going to overdo it on, on tomatoes. Like, you know, maybe they'll have a few hundred grams tops in, in a salad, like, it, it's yeah yeah i agree that that's so i wonder how many calories that would have been so like 20 you know that's that's over 10 kilos of of uh tomatoes yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I got that's... my calories like i got the low end of my calories in but i, was, I ate wow, enough yeah. to get, get my calories <laughs> in. i mean again yeah like I, th I think it's of benefit to recognize like a you know we're running our own bodily experiment and you know while i might thrive on this food you know like while we all thrive on fruits and vegetables, we don't all thrive on all the exact same fruits and vegetables and we can have mm. individual sensitivities. So I think it's fun to treat life as a bit of an experiment and, and run that experiment and, you know, try some months without and try some months with and, you know, notice if you get joint pains from eating them, you know, or you have more symptoms when you're eating them. Well, yeah, then maybe you're somebody who's sensitive to it. But again, I found that to be quite rare, like quite rare. Um, and, and I've also, I've met some people who in their first few years of a raw food diet, having tomatoes would give them some, some, uh, arthritis or kind of joint flare up or pain. And years later they didn't get any at all, you know? So whether that was like leaky gut or, you know, mm. some kind of other kind of absorption or digestive issue or microbiome kind of related issue, um, you know, I can't definitively say, but it, it is kind of interesting just to point out and to do that experimentation with self, you know? absolutely yeah yeah that kind of links into another question i had about um allergies like people were because um obviously there's some people who appear to be allergic to a lot of things like you say especially at the start but then obviously that lessens over time so what what, what would you say is like what do you observe with allergies or like what are causes or yeah it, it, I think it's a definitely an interesting subject that I won't claim to be like the absolute expert on, but I definitely yeah. have learned about it. Um, before I got into raw food, I did like extensive allergy testing and I've done allergy testing in a couple different formats. Um, some with blood work and some with like skin prick testing and with scratch testing and even some with like energetic testing from mm -hmm. numerous different uh, uh, practitioners who believed in their method the best. Right. Uh, when I first started though, I, I was told I was extremely allergic to mangoes and I was like, no, like I love mangoes wow. and I'm eating a lot of mangoes. And, um, what I had learned since then though, was that, you know, oftentimes the things you eat a lot of can be read as being problematic and having an allergy to, because, uh, either, you know, you have leaky gut or, um, and your body creates some antibodies to some of the components of the food that can go through the gut lining. But, right. Um, but these aren't true allergies, you know, like true allergies are things that you don't develop that you just actually like you're born with. And if you have, you know, that food, you have a, a major reaction to, you know, like bee allergies or stuff like that. Um, uh, for the most part, as I understand it, when people develop allergies, allergies later, they're more sensitivities and it, it comes down to like the body being overburdened and things that wouldn't normally cause issues start to cause issues because the body's already at like a threshold of 
being able to handle certain components and foods that otherwise mm-hmm. wouldn't give us issues, you know, and, and again, it can be related to, to leaky gut or, uh, you know, uh, other kind of, uh, digestive ailments, whether it's like Crohn's or colitis, where, you know, again, it can kind of lead to things being absorbed poorly or that shouldn't be absorbed in the first place through the gut lining. So when it's a sensitivity rather than a true allergy, um, those are things that as your diet and lifestyle up, Im- improve and while your body's toxic threshold, which what I, the way I was taught, which isn't totally accurate, but it's a simplification of it is, you know, like your body has a bucket and, you know, when things are overwhelming your system, slowly that bucket fills. And then once it gets to a point where there's no more room in the bucket, it starts spilling over and you get symptoms, right? So that's just a very simplified mm. way of looking at it. And when you've cleaned up your diet long enough that that bucket completely empties, then all of a sudden those things that caused you issues that were sensitivities because your bucket was already full, no longer cause you issues. And so I've seen that multiple times with multiple different foods with people who are just like, oh, I couldn't, like I get this reaction every time I had strawberries. And then like a year or two later, they're like, I can have as many strawberries as I want and I feel amazing, you know? And so again, those, from my understanding and uh, education, those are more sensitivities that have less to do with being a true allergy or really actually negatively impacting your health uh, more so that in that moment your body couldn't handle it due to the overall toxicity or sensitivity due to the gut lining permeability Mm. yeah i think that's a great analogy um i think even if it's not like you know specific like you don't actually have a bucket yeah Yeah, we don't exactly have a bucket but i think it's a great way of visualizing it (laughs) Exactly. Your limitatory exactly. organs were overwhelmed or compromised, or exactly. Your, exactly. your absorption was uh, compromised, and things are getting through that shouldn't, you know, or your microbiome was unbalanced. But it, it, it still kind of, yeah, paints the picture. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, a common one is on dental issues. I've never personally yeah. had any experience of it, but I, I hear this a lot, um, and and I have seen it with a few people in my community and like the comments and things that they they do say. Um, they're, they're suffering from dental issues, especially during like the transition period. Um, so yeah, what, do you have any thoughts on that? For sure. Absolutely. Um, there's various factors there. Um, one that's kind of interesting that I, I've never heard anyone talk about and I can't substantiate with other than just like, uh, me piecing these things together. And it, to me, it makes a lot of sense is, you know, depending upon what you're coming into the lifestyle with. So if someone's coming in with poor dental health, uh, if they're coming in from a depleted state because they've been eating, you know, say a a substandard diet and or, you know, live a very stressful lifestyle, which, you know, depletes the body of many, many nutrients and minerals and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. Of course, they're going to be more predisposed, right? Um, You know, people often think like, oh, well, like, uh, you know, I came in perfect and then this happened. It's like, did you really, you know? But the reason I even bring that up though is, While I'm personally a proponent of primarily whole foods, I'm not anti-juice or anti-supplement, but primarily whole foods is what I see as our optimal. Um, If there was ever a time that green juices and or green powders could be especially helpful, I think is in the first three, six, 12 months of the lifestyle. Again, especially when someone's coming into this lifestyle um, you know, with a less than nutritionally adequate past or a very stressed past, uh, because, you know, oftentimes people get into this and especially if they come into this and are like fruitarian, you know, like I just fruit, you know, just fruit, which has a lower level of mineralization as well. And also is more aggressive in, uh, uh, releasing stored acids and wastes in the body, uh, that if you're coming from a depleted state and all of a sudden you're really aggressively trying to cleanse and get to purity as fast as humanly possible, well, your body's releasing those acids and it needs to buffer them in some way. So guess what happens? It's going to, it's going to be releasing it from any tissues that are deemed as not quite as essential as like the major eliminatory mm. organs. And more than likely it would be your teeth and maybe to some degree, your bones, um, that are going to suffer, you know? And so again, that to me, it just leads back to, even though while I'm primarily, you know, like whole foods based, I think in those first few months and years, uh, if your digestive system isn't able to eat adequate amounts of greens or you're not really drawn to eating large amounts of greens, that can also come back to poor stomach acid, low stomach acid and you know, uh, imbalanced microbiome and all those kinds of things. 
So in that scenario, especially, especially too, if you have teeth issues already, then starting your day with a green juice, adding in more green juices, you know, green juices and green smoothies, green powders, any way you can get in more dense alkaline mineralization from greens and plant foods, um, not just fruits, can be really, really positive, positively impactful on your tooth, tooth health. And I've, I've, I have seen that. Um, so that's one. And that's a big one that I don't see anyone else talk about. And I've actually talked, I've thought about making a dedicated video just on that subject for about five years. And I've been silly and procrastinated, and, you know, but anyways, so that's one. Um, the other thing too, is some people promote, you don't need to brush your teeth. And I, I'm sorry, but that's probably my top five worst advice in the raw food movement, uh, mm -hmm. kind of topics. Uh, I think brushing with a soft bristled brush um, is is very beneficial, especially if you know what you're doing. You're not over irritating, but you're brushing away debris. Um, I'm not huge on like, a, you know, abrasive tooth powders or stuff like that, at least not regularly, once in a while, maybe, but not all the time. Um, being aware that your enamel is softened after eating any kind of acid or even highly uh, acid, sub acid fruits. So not brushing immediately right after. It's not like a you know, intense thing for myself. I usually brush once a day, sometimes twice, like generally right before bed and sometimes in the morning, uh, switching up with water. Um, you know, another really big one that I've seen, not firsthand for me, but I've, in my coaching, people have really bad issues with their teeth when they eat a lot of dried fruit and just eat it straight, you know, and especially if they do that and they don't brush their teeth, that's like complete recipe mm. for destruction of the teeth. Um, so yeah, I mean, underripe citrus, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I love dried fruit, you know, like I, I actually eat a fair amount of dates, but I don't eat them. I blend them into smoothies and then it's not as impactful. It's more chewing dried fruit and having the stick residue, the sticky residues on your teeth, getting between teeth and then not brushing or just, you know, leaving them on there is huge. Um, and then lastly, I'd also say I've seen people have issues with their teeth when they're really on a less is more mindset and trying to eat minimally or slowly eat less and less. And they're just not getting enough calories and thus not getting enough, uh, nutrients, you know? So, um, mm. yeah, so I, I think those are really the main things and it can kind of come back to like, you know, just having good oral hygiene, eating enough fruits and enough greens so that you're not craving foods all the time and you're not craving salt all the time. Um, and, and, you know, avoiding things that really stick to your teeth or being very mindful, whether that's the dried fruits or the nuts and seeds, just eating them straight. Be mindful that, uh, you know, you want to make sure you brush or swish at least afterwards. And those things I think are better off being blended rather than just eaten by handfuls. Mm. Absolutely. Great tips. I think, yeah, like because that, that is the added benefit of when you're active and you eat more and especially greens, like you say, you're, you're just naturally as a byproduct getting in more minerals. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Mm. More minerals, um, uh, a better omega-3 to 6 ratio. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a more well-rounded uh, way of eating that, you know, causes less cravings and more nutrient satiation and, you know, I just want to quickly add to when you asked before about things have changed. Um, mm -hmm. My diet hasn't changed a lot, but one thing that did kind of change a little bit is I, I put more focus on the omega-3 rich fat sources. So probably the last six years, you know, when I'm eating fats, my base is generally hemp, chia, and flax. And then I do other stuff outside of that. I'm not afraid of other fats by any means, but that's definitely my base. And personally, I, I'm not really attracted to, I've never really been attracted to almonds. Like I, I just never have. I know a lot of people who love almonds and almond milk, but it's crazy because it's like a thousand to one omega six to, to three, you know, it's like yeah. among the highest, you know, cashews all have an occasion, but they're, they're pretty high as well. But yeah, hemp chia flax, I find uh, really beneficial and uh, the, the best science out there, I think points towards having a, a good omega three to six ratio is incredibly helpful for uh, brain health as well as just like connective tissue and everything else. And uh uh, nerve singling and stuff like that mm, absolutely yeah that's something something i uh, i've also changed maybe in the past year or so like it um like i make touching on the dried fruit like data aid sometimes or banana smoothie with like some flax or chia or something like that like you say to kind of boost because it's very low fat otherwise which which is fine but yeah. like you say that that ratio in my mind, it, it sits somewhere between like one to one and like three to one or four to one. Um, yeah. 
w would you say that's like a fair evaluation of of like the optimal um omega-3 to 6 ratio yeah that's that's what is most widely considered the optimal ratio and some people might say one to two or one to one being like like perfect um mm. i mean something that's kind of interesting i think is a good point to make with this as well is if, if you just eat fruits and vegetables like no nuts or seeds at all you're pretty much automatically within that range you know most fruits yep. and vegetables are in that range and you know hemp seeds is like one to there's one to two or one to three um and then flax is the opposite it's like the higher like omega-3 yeah. you know and, and chia too is the higher so it's like you know it, in the context of eating small amounts of fats, it's not going to make a giant difference if you're eating loads of fruits and vegetables, and especially if you're eating tropical fruits, because things like mangoes and papaya and even honeydew are actually already higher in omega-3. They're actually like, they kind of buffer that a little bit. But if you eat anything more than a very small amount, then it's going to be more impactful, you know, and, uh, you know, focusing on those, uh, the hemp, chia, and flax as the mainstay. And, you know, it doesn't have to be every meal. It doesn't have to be every day. And it's not like, Oh my God, I had a bottle of tahini last month. Now I got to just eat flax for two months to even it all out. I'm not like that, uh, you know, with it. But I, I think it's worth being mindful of over the kind of longer term, uh, especially if, you know, any of those uh, kind of genetic possibilities are in your, your family history, then yeah, maybe you can pay a little bit more attention to it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it just so happens too that I find those are some of the tastiest and easiest to use ones too, because they're, they're so small and you can just put them right in and, you know, they stay really fresh, you know, the, the flax and chia when they're in their whole form, for example, you know, so. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I found it useful in the past just to look up the ratio of all of them. And then it's quite interesting. Like you say, like almonds and cashews, they're some of the highest in like omega sixes, which for anyone yeah. who doesn't know is like the, the pro inflammatory. Um, Absolutely. Which we, yeah. we need some pro inflammatory nutrients because, you know, course, we injure yeah. ourselves, we want inflammation. It's just, you don't want that, overblown and a lot of people they find if they have like you know joint issues or chronic inflammation issues or even headaches and migraines and stuff like that if they uh if they uh really focus on this this kind of balance and and make the the higher omega-3s the mainstay of their fat source it's like you know it's so easy like i mean you make a tomato sauce well put like a tablespoon of hemp seeds in it and it thickens it a little bit the same way as sun-dried tomatoes too but uh it just bolsters that omega-3 content and makes it a little bit more satiating and you're like it's just so easy to put a little bit in here and there and i mean flax seeds are one of the cheapest and if you're some people are concerned about flax um I, I, the the research and everything i've looked into I, i'm not worried about flax but if you are for its uh potential estrogenetic properties which are vastly overblown uh chia is the next best alternative and both of those mm. are generally pretty inexpensive absolutely yeah, well, if I start growing man boobs, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> That's bad timing with it. I don't got any yet, you know. I, I don't got any yet, and I mean, yeah. I, I probably, probably use flax the most, but I, I mean, it's pretty even between. Uh, I like when I'm making a dish, like I make a curry, for example, I might use like three tablespoons of hemp and one of flax or one of chia, and I kind mm -hmm. of alternate them back and forth, but. Uh, yeah, no, no man boobs, and I, I'm really not worried about my testosterone. And in some ways, in some ways, I almost wish it would lower it a little bit, you know. So as uh, <laughs> you know, always thinking with this head, you know. But uh, it's uh, yeah, I, most people find on a, a raw vegan diet, you know, especially if they're getting enough calories and have exercise, that their testosterone levels are above average, and that's uh, definitely where I'm at mm. and have been my whole raw food journey. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. When I interviewed Josh X, who's He's on like a bodybuilding journey on like a high fruit diet. I think his testosterone levels were like way off the upper limit, which, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see because it's um, not what's, you know, reported in the mainstream. No, yeah, they, uh, they think the exact opposite, you know, like eating all these foods that would make them manly and t yeah, they usually yeah. actually lower their testosterone and, and every other great biomarker for health. You know, so it's a, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll just reel off a few more na uh, now and then we'll finish because I appreciate it's getting on a little bit. Um, yeah, so we've, we've tackled most of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, thoughts on sprouts? Oh, um, sprouts. I this. Yeah. That's a fun one. So, yeah, um, I'll give a little teeny bit of history than my thought. 
So before I got into raw food, because, you know, like I said, I was transitioning for four and a half years from everything to high raw vegan. And probably, if I'm right, about the, the last two years, I got really heavily into sprouts. Like before I fully got into raw food, I was reading books by like Steve Merowitz, the Sprout Man, and um, other books on sprouting. And I like mostly was sprouting um, things like alpha alpha and clover and some mustard and the, all the smaller little ones. But I'd have like I'd have little wicker, non-painted wicker sprout baskets, which I haven't seen those around much lately. But they were really good. I, I would just like sprinkle the seeds in there and uh, soak them, and then I'd I'd have little like plastic greenhouses, and I'd have them in every windowsill in my house. And like I was eating sprouts all the time, and I, I really loved it. And um, mind you, though, I mean it was a bit of a pain in the ass, you know, like cleaning the sprout baskets and always being on top of it, but. I had a good system going, whereas in my windows and I had a filter on my shower. So I just, you know, shower them off in my shower and stuff like that. Um, so I used to love that. And I also, I used to love fermenting and doing other stuff like that. I made my own sourdough. I made, I, at one point I was making my own cheese and stuff like that. And uh, a paneer for Indian food and, and uh, like a whole bunch of stuff, kimchi and all that. But anyways, back to sprouts. I was enjoying all that. And then um, the last six months before I went all raw, I was reading more and more hygiene books and uh, learning more about hygiene. And then I met Doug Graham and, you know, and it just, it, that was when I was a little more black and white, strict hygiene. And it wasn't really promoted as a, a great kind of food. It was kind of looked at like you know, you'd never find sprouts in nature, really, you know, like you wouldn't be eating them like that. And, you know, there are some negative qualities and chances of uh, bacteria or, stuff like that. And I was like, well, if I don't need them, it's kind of a pain in the ass. I'll just focus on the whole greens and this and that. So I, I went at least five years where I don't think I had any at all. And then probably the next five years, really infrequently, I don't even, I can't even say I remember ever having them. Um, and then it was probably in the last eight to 10 years where I've like played with them a little bit more here and there. And then I've had periods of time where I had a fair amount uh, and then periods of time where I had uh, quite a lot. And then periods of time where I had almost none. You know, and um, these days, actually, right now, it's kind of funny because I actually have some stuff sprouting right now. Um, I have uh, two two different types types of chickpeas that I'm sprouting. Um, I have three different types of uh, microgreens that I'm sprouting, and I have uh, two different types of lentils that I'm sprouting. And that sounds like a heck of a lot. Um, now, what I prefer to do, though, actually, is like the hardier sprouts, like the chickpeas, lentils. I like to sprout them and then generally put them in portion sizes and freeze them. And, um, and then I'll use uh, like, you know, take out a portion size, which for me is anywhere from one to two cups. Somebody who's starting might be like a half a cup to one cup. Uh, and I freeze them because then the texture changes so that it's like, it, it, it tastes more like a cooked chickpea mm. or, or cooked legume. Um, and it's also easier to digest. And of course then too, it's like you can, you know, sprout a whole big batch and then divide it and just have like, a month's worth of sprouts when I feel like having my chickpea or my lentils in a curry or a chili or, you know, utilize it in a, a burger. Like for example, like sprouting some lentils and then pulsing some of the lentils into the burger mix or into a neat ball mix or um, chickpeas into a falafel mix. It makes it more authentic, gives it a different texture and flavor and taste and, and obviously to a different nutrient ratio is a super inexpensive way to get in some different vegetables and stuff. Um, the microgreens and stuff like that, I still find are a pain in the ass, um, but it's pretty minimal. Uh, I enjoy them. Um, and if I could distill all of this down, I think they can be a fun addition to the diet, but I in no way, shape or form think they're necessary nor like definitively better than, and in some ways they have negatives to them as well. Like I definitely notice even when I slowly introduce them and, and bring them up, I get a little more gas and, you know, I mean, by their nature, they're a little bit more gassy. Uh, they're a little bit heavier, which, you know, in some ways, if you're looking for something a little bit heavier, more stick to your ribs and more kind of like, Ooh, you know, like it's kind of fun. But if you really like feeling super light and just the feeling of having a fruit and greens meal, well, yeah, it's probably going to feel too heavy. You might not enjoy it. Right. So, um, mm. I don't elevate them. Uh, but I also don't toss them away as not being of any value to the lifestyle in the bigger picture. You know, um, I think it's something that, you know, can be fun and uh, can be experimented with, but if it's something that doesn't appeal to you, it's not like, Oh my God, you're, you're missing out. Um, that, that said, there have been some people that I've met 
who started developing some symptoms and then the addition of things like lentil sprouts alleviated those symptoms. And, you know, that could be due to, uh, very likely is due to the higher lysine and uh, different amino acid amounts that are lower in typical fruits and vegetables, but are higher in those. So if somebody's not eating enough greens or vegetables, or for some reason just has a higher need for those, whether it's for athletics or this or that, they may see some benefit, you know, but I'm not definitive in that, that everyone needs it at all times. But I would say, I think it's valuable to experiment, to try these things out, to see if you enjoy them and see if the potential uh, negatives versus positives weigh out and where your balance is, you know, and that's kind of where I am now. It's like, I go some weeks and months with none and have some where I eat more and I enjoy it. Um, I don't know. I, that's kind of where I'm at with them. Hmm. Yeah, because some people talk about them like uh, a real miracle food. Like, um, mm. there's some people who are huge proponents, just exclusively like sprouts and fruit. But I've always mm. wondered if they're necessary. But I guess, like you say, if you're potentially missing something in your diet, whether that's through like um, a lack of variety or maybe like quality. maybe yeah, exactly quality. Maybe extreme athletic endeavors. I guess. Um, yeah. 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 And I mean. People often overstate them. Like, and I've, I've, I've behind mm. the scenes talked to some people about that because they're like, you know, it's like a thousand times more nutrition than the whole. It's like, yeah, is it yeah. really? It's like, no, it's actually not. It's like when you actually look at it, it's like, yeah, there are some some isolated nutrients that are like, you know, sulforaphane in broccoli sprouts. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much higher. The sulforaphane is much higher, but all the other nutrients aren't ten hundred thousand times, and some of them are lower. You know, it's like. Um, again, people like to over, over dramatize and make things black and white and make more incredible claims. Cause again, it grabs more and, and it, it usually stems from them being grabbed by that, you know, like learning this a thousand times more. And they look at that one isolated nutrient and go, wow, it really is. And then they don't consider that that's not all of the different nutrients and that there is the possibility of, you know, them being contaminated or, you know, like I've had bad experiences of sprouts where I actually, I've only had two or three experiences in this raw journey where I ate something that made me feel like I was going to die. Like, like my entire body sweating and like crunched up in a ball and puking and, and diarrhea at the same time. And one of those times was from, from sprouts. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you're uh, mindful of that and cleaning your jars. And I actually disinfect my sprouts. So like when I'm sprouting something, I make sure the jar is very clean. And then, uh, then I put the sprouts in there. I fill up the amount of sprouts plus double of water and a cap full of vinegar and swish it around, like just white vinegar, swish it around and leave it sit 15 minutes, swish it around. And that kills any bacteria on the sprouts or in the jar. And then I rinse it very thoroughly. So it doesn't have a vinegar residue. And then that ensures, uh, at least does a better job in ensuring that there's not going to be any bacterial growths or any contamination. So you don't know where they're grown or what they were processed in, or if there's a little bit on the jar. Um, and some people go a step further where they uh, make a very dilute H2O2, uh, hydrogen peroxide and water mix. I, I can't remember if it's like food grade hydrogen peroxide mixed with seven or 12 parts water. Um, and then they just put that in a spritz bottle and they, they spritz the sprouts occasionally and especially before uh like the day before consuming because that will again kill any bacteria and stuff on them and i'm not saying this to be like oh my god you have to be like super anal and if you if you mess up you're you're dead um but it is an extra precaution because it, it can happen especially if you like mm. you know just get random random sprouting seeds from wherever store and you don't clean your jars very well um but yeah all, all this to say again yeah I, I i think they can be fun i think they can be a valuable addition they're often overstated uh, I don't think they're necessary, but in some conditions they can be helpful. And yeah, they can add a nutrient punch, especially with things like the broccoli sprouts and, and they're inexpensive and cheap. And it's like, some people love it. You know, like some people, they love to plant foods and grow and see it grow. And some yeah. people like doing that is like, it actually fulfills a need and it's fun for them. And other people, it's a pain in the ass and they don't really enjoy it. And they'd rather just go to the store and buy some greens or stuff like that. And I don't think one's better or worse definitively. It just comes down to what do you really enjoy and what makes you have fun in this lifestyle and stick to it and enjoy your food more. And, you know, to me, that's kind of the, the, the brass tacks on it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. It comes back to knowing thyself. Like, yeah. like we touched on earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a few more. Um, obviously you talked about dried fruits earlier. 
and I personally also blend them into smoothies sometimes, like Datorade or things like that. Um, so yeah, just quick thoughts on dried fruits. Um, yeah, in their normal state, soaked in smoothies. However, you want to take it. Yeah, I think. I mean, to me, that's the optimal way to consume dried fruit, specifically for tooth health and for ease of digestion. You know, uh, in general, fresh is going to be best. You know, fresh with the water content. If you can get that, that's going to be more ideal. I, I typically, for myself, consider dried fruits kind of a backup. Like I usually have some on hand just in case I don't have other stuff ready. So I have food. I don't, I'm not starving and thinking of anything else. It's like, well, I got the date smoothie. That's good. Or I use them in recipes, you know, like I, I'm making a sauce and I just want a little bit of sweetness. I throw a date or two into it, you know, and sometimes I like to use things like dried mulberries or raisins, um, you know, in banana puddings or in like little like dried fruit bars and stuff like that, you know, whatever. Um, those can be fun on occasion when I'm traveling. Sometimes I'll travel with like a box of dates and a head of celery or a box of dates and a, a head of lettuce and just, you know, stick the dates into the celery or, or roll up two dates in a, in one leaf of lettuce and just chew it up. And the celery or apples or lettuce kind of acts as a bit of a toothbrush and balances out the minerals and the water content a little bit. So it makes it a little bit easier on digestion, but that's also just for the ease and convenience of having something that's rich in calories and takes low space and doesn't get bruised or battered easily. And you can take it on a plane or a car easily, you know, so it's kind of a convenience and ease factor. Um, but I, I wouldn't rely on dried fruit as like the mainstay of your calories long-term, but in, uh, you know, some seasons or in some pinches, uh, or for some treats and travel packs and stuff, I think it's a great, great uh, option to have just being mindful again of your teeth because, Two things I've seen have a people have a hard time with dried fruit. One is digest, or actually three things. One is digestively, if you're like over relying on it, because it is harder on digestion compared to water rich whole whole foods. Um, two is the teeth, you know, and you know constantly snacking on them or just not really being mindful of your teeth and eating lots of dried fruit. And three is weight gain. You know, I've had a, a consult and friend who, um, you know, they're eating a very balanced lifestyle and diet and. They were using dates as a stress kind of reliever. And like anytime they're a little bit stressed, they just snack on a few dates. And what it ended up being was they were eating enough calories from everything else, but they were still, because again, we were talking before about like eating when you're in a calm, balanced state. Well, no, they're, whenever they're stressed, they're snacking on dates. And they're on average eating one and a half to two pounds of dates on top of everything else they wow. ate. And they, they were never achieving their weight goals. They were always overweight and never felt good. And once they took that out and came to more peace with, what they're experiencing in the moment and not stress eating and, and just using dates in specific recipes for meals, they're much more easily uh, finding their, their, their optimal weight coming into the picture. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cause you know, two pounds that that's like a kilo to, yeah, it's, a lot. it's like yeah, it's probably, 3, calories extra. Yeah. It's, it's usually probably over your, most people's daily calories and dates, but it's so easy done, isn't it? Cause they're low yeah. water content and high, yeah, high calorie density. So yeah, it, yeah. it makes sense. I mean, it would, have, it would have led them to eating less than their needs with the other foods because, you know, they're, but, mm. but they're still, they're vastly exceeding their caloric needs and still eating full meals while snacking on dates multiple times a day. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, just a couple more quick ones. Um, thoughts on herbs. Um, I guess there's two ways Mm -hmm. you could take that because <laughs> well three Culinary actually or, yeah. or uh, medicinal herbs right yeah um, yeah I'm, I'm much more uh i mean we'll start here I, I i'm much more interested in culinary herbs rather than medicinal herbs personally um i think medicinal herbs can have a time and a place but that's definitely going back back more to the allopathic model of trying to treat symptoms and trying to intellectually direct the body and its systems and to me, the vast, vast majority of the time when people are trying to intellectualize and uh, and trying to direct, self-direct with their intellectual intellect, uh, it's missing the mark. You know, it's like it's, it's putting the intellect above the body's majesty and the creator. And to me, you know, just supplying the body with what it requires, the body is going to do what it's going to do in its most optimal fashion and optimal uh, sequence. So we might be thinking... Oh gosh, well, I got to detox harder and I, I just need to stimulate my liver. So I'm going to take these liver, liver stimulating things or you know, I'm not filtering. So I got to do this and that. And to me, again, for the largest, largest percentage of the time, 
um, that's more about making dollars than actual sense and the, the body's actual uh, ma majesty and proper sequencing, you know. Um, that said, I mean, just like if somebody has a, you know, a heart attack, you know, they might need some stimulation and some shockers to restart their heart. Well, I mean, there can be a time and a place and I don't throw the ba baby out with the bathwater. Um, but again, I think it's still, again, going back to the allopathic model and I, I much more resonate with the health model that the body is infinitely intelligent, self-directing, self-cleansing, self-healing. And all we really got to do is give it everything it needs and step out of the way, you know? And so if, if somebody is just eating fruit, no greens whatsoever, which I, I don't really promote a, fr a pure fruitarian diet. Uh, I don't see any advantages of it. And I see far too many potential disadvantages, especially if someone's not living on their own farm, eating peak quality, freshly dropped fruit in a low stress environment in general. I only see detriment, but if you're just eating fruit, well, you know, herbs are going to fill in some missing gaps and could produce some positive benefits. But instead, if you're eating a well-rounded, you know, fruit and vegetable and green based diet, I, I find them again, making more dollars than cents and for the largest degree, not necessary. Um, you know, I mean, there's compounds in them that are irritating and stimulating and sure there's nutrients in them. But you can get those nutrients from less irritating, less stimulating plant sources that we would normally be eating in nature. Um, you know, there might be the situation, you, you can actually see this in nature, where an animal gets uh, an infestation or gets a parasite, and they're drawn to a, a potent herb that is more medicinal to help rid themselves of it into intuitively or through being taught by their parents, you know, like, it's, it's amazing, but um, there's some situations where primates, they get worms or they get a, a parasite and they go to a very potent leaf and they fold it up like a fan and they just eat the leaves without even chewing them. They just eat them and it's just like, it's anti-parasitic nature and the, the fiber being folded up like that, it helps push them out. Well, I mean, yeah, that was, that was a case where that was really beneficial and necessary, but if they didn't have it, they wouldn't be eating it like that. Like they were just so in tune with their body, they're utilizing it for a very specific purpose, right? Um, so again, I mean with diagnostics, like people think like, oh my God, like everyone has parasites and everyone has this. So you've got to buy this entire cleanse and you got to do this. And it's very hard and irritating on the system. It can even cause blood and, you know, it, it can be pretty intense and often expensive. Um, to me, a more rational approach is if you don't have any symptoms, well, you know, it's up to you whether you check things out. But if you have some symptoms, maybe get a stool test or blood test to see if you have a parasite. And then you know exactly how to treat it rather than just taking broad brand kind of anti-parasite cleanses or, you know, any of these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, I, I just think more information is better being precise and recognizing that it's uh, a lot of times, you know, it's more about money, money making, at least my perspective. Mm, definitely. Yeah, perhaps benefit for some, like you say, but yeah, especially, especially when it's like a long term thing. And it's like, yeah, take these and then you'll be clean. But oh wait, no, maybe you should take them every quarter or something because you know, you're gonna keep accumulating parasites. Then it just seems like a, a very convenient business model <laughs> to me oh, personally. It's great. It's great. Yeah. I, I wish I had more of those, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of that... kinda of like kinda of like you're saying before, you're you're uh, kind of mentioning kind of the fear based mentality and, and you know, fear based promotion and a lot of it is that way, you know, and it, I'm not going to sit on a high horse and say there's no reality where people can get parasites or this or that. But when, when people are like, everyone has them all the time and you got to have this cleanse kit all the time. And uh, that's not what I've seen. I haven't seen, you know, direct evidence of that. And again, I think often it's, you know, misconception and, and more money than uh, sense. hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. Um, just, there was a final one. Oh yeah, just about because obviously, like you said, um, at the start of your journey, you were very, you were more inclined to do like mono meals and very simple, um, and obviously now you incorporate things like um, like mushrooms or, um, chili, onion, garlic occasionally, like ginger. Do you find mm -hmm. do you know do you observe any changes in yourself? Just for a bit of context, like if I have chili or garlic, I have like mm -hmm. body odor or like certain things like that. Um. What have you noticed since reincorporating different yeah, foods? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just say straight up in general, in uh, the short midterm, uh, you know, none of like just having simple, pure hygienic, uh, I feel the most streamlined, most kind of like bouncy, 
uh, most vibrant kind of light, like very truthfully. Um, garlic, onions, definitely body odor. You know, I mean, it's, they're high in sulfur. Um, you know, I noticed some some body odor and also some uh, kind of that slippery slope where you want to use them more often. Um, but I also do more from an intellectual side. So I'll be honest with that. More from an intellectual side, recognize uh, some of the nutritional benefits from having those occasionally, um, as well as, you know, like the microbiome balancing effects they have. People often think that they just wipe out, but they actually have uh, uh, prebiotic fibers in there that are beneficial for the microbiome that, that actually do. Because I, I remember the old hygiene was like, oh, like it was it's an antibiotic. Like, how does it know? Like, doesn't it just wipe out everything? It's like, no, it actually, it has prebiotics that feed some bacteria we want, and it has antibiotic properties that wipe out things we don't want. You know, so when somebody's feeling a little bit off or a little under the weather, I think they honestly can have a bit of a place, kind of like I was talking about the the primates having a, a parasite infestation and eating specific leaves or eating certain potent plants to try and wipe that out and bring more balance. I, I do feel intuitively led to that, and the more I've learned uh, intellectually, that makes sense to me as well. But like anything, I think they can be vastly overdone and become just kind of like a, a, a culinary uh, slash stimulation kind of crutch, you know. And so I'm aware of that. Um, I, I find the same thing with hot peppers. But again, they are also potent antiparasitics, you know. So, you know, these things are pan antiparasitic, antibacterial and stuff like that. So they can help bring balance. And, you know, I do now kind of wonder at times that, um, I really went deeper into them and was experimenting with them a lot and really drawn to them. If I was clearing something out, it's possible. You know, I, I can't say because I didn't test, but it's possible. Mm. Um, but all this to say too, what I've personally found is ginger of all the quote unquote from a hygienic point of view, irritating kind of food substances, uh, ginger to be the most mild where, where I don't notice any negatives at all. I don't notice any body odor. Um, and I don't find like, oh, I just need to have more and more and more. I could have it or not. And I enjoy it when I have it. Um, I used to be so much more into hot peppers. You know, like I used to like want them at every single dinner meal. And now I could have them or not. I don't care. Garlic's the same. Like I, I don't care if I have it, if I have it, sure. But I do notice I stink more when I have it. Um, yeah, onion, kind of the same. I, I often go between either having onion or if I don't have onion, then sometimes I'll have more bitter greens like... Uh, like arugula, which is, you know, not considered irritating or non-hygienic, but does kind of have a little bit similar flavor profiles, a little bit of that spiciness. So sometimes I'll just pulse in like a couple handfuls of arugula into my sauce and it gives it kind of that rounded kind of bitter, spicy flavor to things. Um, I personally haven't noticed, like I've, I've read lots of yogic literature and uh, stuff like that, and, you know, like you know, they talk about uh, onions and garlic kind of raising negative emotion, making it harder to meditate, kind of a registic kind of mindset. I personally can't say that I've noticed that like too large, large amounts, maybe like a, a shadow, but I'm also not like uh, training to be a monk and meditating hours and hours every single day. And, you know, they probably are more attuned in their body. And if like if your real, real goal is like meditation all the time, then yeah, you might be mm. better off abstaining from those things. Um, the last thing I will mention, though, about this whole kind of thing, something that I've observed, and whether it's direct to this or whether it's direct to what we were talking about before with, like, the mindset of things and, like, should, shouldn't, can, can't, you know, flexibility kind of mindset, I've often noticed people who are strict, strict hygienic, not all the time, but a larger percentage don't seem to thrive as much as people who are a little more flexible and occasionally include those. And again, so whether that means that there is benefit in terms of, you know, like the microbiome and rebalancing or, you know, uh, parasite or, um, you know, or some nutrients like the, the rich sulfur compounds, which we do need sulfur for our detoxification pathways. And if we're not eating durian, which is rich in sulfur, um, then, you know, the other place we're likely to be getting it is garlic and onions. Um, you know, so that does help with detoxification. So whether it's some nutrients like that. Uh, or whether it's again, just the mindset of like, like abstaining or like being tight or judgmental, um, having an impact, I can't definitively say, but that's an observation I've made that people a little bit more flexible tend to seem to thrive and be a little bit more vibrant looking, you know, and mm. sometimes the other way is a little bit more gaunt and black circles or 
you know, kind of like me, kind of like a mm. uh, what would be the way kind of um, anxious seeming, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You say that with the observations, I think, I think, yeah, that probably is the case, whether it's um, like you said, like a, a combination of factors, but yeah. Usually yeah. is right. I mean, like mm. kind of going back to the black and white, like, we always like to pin things on yeah. one one thing and make a nice little bow. Um, but it, I think it often can be all through, like multiple. I mean, generally speaking, it's, all, it's almost always multiple, multiple factors. Mm. Um, but I think those would probably be the predominant, you know, like the mindset and then potentially the nutrient nutrient ratio and the microbiome kind of readjusting. But uh, which is the higher point? It might be different for each individual. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. And just uh, very, very quickly, cacao and things like that. Obviously, there's some people who really promote it. Um, mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on cacao? I, I think it's kind of reflecting upon all my other stuff. It's like I had a period of time where I was like never like bad, evil. Um, and then I experimented with myself. And, and I personally, for me, don't notice any drawbacks unless I'm like eating. I had one time. Actually, I, I, coached, a, I coached a chocolatier. And as part of the payment, they had a chocolate party for me. And that was like one of the first times I had had anything more than like a square or two of raw cacao. You know, this is, I think, 13 years ago or something like that. And we, we ate like a pound, like a pound of chocolate. And, um, and I was messed up. Like I was like, I felt like I smoked like three joints. Um, I, we were partying and having fun. It was like, Woo, yeah! you know, it was, it was really fun. Um, but then the next morning I woke up, like it felt like I got shot in the stomach. Um, <laughs> and I felt so depressed. Like, obviously I just like went through all my serotonin. Cause I was like, just, I, I woke up the next morning, literally so depressed crying. Like I was, I was crying and didn't want to see anyone. And it was like, so, I mean, definitely it has an effect as stimulatory in nature. Um, it can for sure be overdone and certain people are more uh, sensitive to it than others, you know, like, um, I was never sensitive to caffeine and while it's not caffeine, it's through theobromide, it works similarly, um, but I was never sensitive to caffeine. So like I, I never got addicted to coffee because it would take me like literally like six or seven cups before I'd even notice a buzz, you know? So like some people one cup and they're like, Woo! like really buzzing, you know? So for me, even with cacao, like I, I, I prefer the chocolate flavor of cacao over carob. Uh, so I like right now I do have some cacao in my closet. It's not a daily thing. It's not even a weekly thing. But when I have it, I have it. Um, uh, I kind of respect it that way. And I, I have used it in a ceremonial stance as a heart opener, you know, and stuff like that in Costa Rica, fresh, you know, like high, high quality cacao ceremony and stuff like that. Um, so I, I would say for myself, like, I'm not strongly anti. I'm not strongly pro. Um, it's another one that I think is like a personal choice and kind of up to the individual if they find they enjoy it and find benefit from it. Obviously there's some nutrients in it. Uh, they're like really high in some nutrients. Um, but there are also some stimulatory negative qualities that can be very much overdone. And it's to me almost like I'd almost more treat it like in between food and more like a medicinal plant, you know, that, uh, you know, is deserving of either some respect or, or standoffishness if you're sensitive to it. But, uh, it's not something I think everyone needs by any means. But I also don't think that it's like throw the baby out and it's like evil and no one, there's no value to it. And if you're eating it, you're not pure or you're stupid. You know, I, I don't mm. take that viewpoint at all. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's like basically everything we covered is that <clears throat> nuance and um, the black and white labels. Oftentimes they, they miss, they, they miss like a fundamental point. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think too often, you know, somebody has a personal experience and then they just say like, well, that's what it is. And everyone, everyone should listen to me because my experience is this and it's the same for everyone. It's like, sorry, like, mm. I don't know, to me, that's, uh, having a very narrow mindset, you know, it's, uh, mm. not really a, a wider view of the realities yeah. or well-researched. Mm, like their individual truth and experience mm. is the truth. Like, yes, yeah, it's very yeah. true. But yeah. And yeah. if anyone's made it this far, um, do you have any closing, <laughs> tips or advice like so they're, they're here they're probably like if they're anything like me especially early on in the journey researching things like heavily like diving into this like benefits of this benefits of that mm -hmm. what do you have any closing thoughts or tips for people just how they can just stick in stick to it for the long run because you've been doing it 20 years 
Um, you seem to be enjoying it. Obviously, we all have our ups and downs, but yeah. And any tips for like sticking to healthy choices long term, like predominantly a raw vegan diet, but just just optimal health in general. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, first off, uh, I just want to thank you, Dale, for inviting me on and uh, the fun questions. I, I, I'll admit, I, Q and A's and, and talking like this is my favorite. I, I absolutely love it, and uh, I really hope anyone who's listening still you get value from it. And thanks everyone who wrote in those questions and stuff like that. Is is obviously a uh, more poignant when it's direct questions, not me just fluffing stuff, you know. So, um, so thank you very much for this opportunity to share and connect. Uh, you know, the big thing, and I often just say this is enjoy it like honestly like you know we make unless you have like a you know if you have obviously if you have like a major chronic ailment like yeah still try and enjoy it but you might want to walk a even firmer path and make sure you get like really good advice and and you know learn from those who've been walking this for a long time not necessarily you know um just kind of the black and white advice and smaller kind of uh, limited experience kind of groups and stuff and you know I, I think it's beneficial to again just like honor yourself, honor the process, have some patience. Um, in, again, enjoy every, every single experience, like it, do your dangness, no matter what you choose. Cause it's very unlikely again, that you're just going to be like bing and just like walk a straight line and never have any deviation. You know, life is a dance. There is going to be likely some sways, especially when the, you get a really hard hand in your life or a major trauma. Um, you know, but the more patient you can be and the more, accepting of the moment and what you choose and really try and honor it. like try and be there present no matter what with what you choose like experience it you know you're gonna you're gonna find you grow and uh have so much more ease and grace through the process um i've often said I, i've i've judged myself and others way too harshly uh more so myself than others but i mean any judgment of self is going to reflect to some extent uh in my past and i like I had a loathing for myself and let go of gratitude and like, just like experience some major swings because of how not patient, not accepting, not loving of self and choices and labeling things and others and, and behaviors as good and bad, right and wrong. Um, then I wouldn't wish that on anyone. You know, I really, really wouldn't. So that'd be my big, just take it home. Just like, yeah, I mean, experiment, streamline, have fun, you know, be present and be compassionate for yourself and others. I mean, to me, that's what this lifestyle is about, is like expanding compassion and awareness. And I don't think there's any greater uh, practice in that than just being in present moment awareness and totally loving and patient and accepting of self. Mm, absolutely. I think that's a great, great final message. And yeah, like Chris said, if, if you made it this far, appreciate you listening in and yeah i appreciate your time and your insights and um yeah hope everyone has a wonderful day peace and love everyone so guys